Okay, so we should be. Make sure we get over there. It is official. We are on Facebook. Okay. Uh, we've got it. We're being live streamed. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of the HCMA's Big Hearted Warrior Tour. I'm Lisa Salberg, founder and CEO of the HCMA, and it's my pleasure to welcome you this evening with our team from University of Kansas. I'll introduce them all in just a moment. Just some housekeeping items before we get too deep into all HCM data. Um, we are streaming on Facebook right now. It is, I got to like, the times are all weird. It is 7 p.m. Pacific time where I happen to be right now. I'm in California. Uh, my team is back in New Jersey and Pennsylvania. And then we have Kansas. We've pretty much got the country covered tonight. Um, during the event this evening, we will be streaming on Facebook. We will not be taking any questions from Facebook. If you would like to join us in the Zoom webinar, please go to 4hcm.org and you can still register and join us in here. And then you can ask questions. This uh, presentation will be recorded and will live on our YouTube site as well as our website. So if you wanna rewatch it at any other time, you're welcome to come back and revisit it as many times as you need to get the information that you want. Um, with that said, I just wanna introduce uh, Stacy Titus, our Center of Excellence Coordinator and Assistant on the Big Hard Warrior Tour, and Julie Russo, our Volunteer Coordinator. Uh, we're gonna be doing some call outs. We need, we need some people to be calling Julie. Julie's got some projects for you. So get ready to get involved there. And with that, I will introduce um, the director of the HCM program at the uh, at KU. I always just call you guys KU, University of Kansas, so long. KU is nice and short. So Lauren Birnbaum and I have known each other a long time. Not exactly sure how long, Lauren, but you do have the, um, the very special uh, role of being the last live event HCMA did in 2019 before the world shut down. So Lauren, welcome to the internet with us and thanks for your being with us tonight. Thank you. And I'm gonna say we met, it was 20 years ago, 21 or 22, ACC, HRS, one of those kinds of things. Uh, uh, definitely, and that just makes me feel a little bit old. So let's just say uh, over 10, I mean, 20 years. My expertise goes back, my expertise uh, that I'm still trying to get. Uh, my interest in HCM really goes back to the 70s, uh, I guess actually 80s when I was uh, a cardiology fellow and I was rounding in the CCU at Barnes and my wife called me and told me that a good friend from high school that I hadn't seen for a bunch of years uh, had died suddenly and that he had been uh, at autopsy diagnosed with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So I, I have paid special attention to HCM for 40 plus years now. Um, we've got a great team at KU. Uh, Jared Kvapel is, and, and everybody who's presenting tonight, you know, is a clinician in the trenches taking care of the HCM patients. Uh, Jared's expertise beyond his clinical expertise is in uh, echocardiography. Uh, we have Harak Shah, who uh, is one of our advanced heart failure uh, physicians, and Paulo Roldan, who just joined us pretty recently, uh, also from the advanced heart failure space uh, and, and worked in their HCM Center of Excellence at Utah, Salt Lake City. Uh, Barb Lee is one of our nurses, uh, and, and Barb has become uh, perhaps, if not the Midwest expert on Mavic Hampton, a Midwest <laughs> expert on Mavic Hampton, and how to negotiate the websites and all the processes involved in uh, you know, everybody that I want to start on Mavic Hampton is getting Mavic Hampton. So that's no mean feat. Hats off to Barb. Uh, not on screen tonight. Tom Rosamond is our expert in MRI. Greg Muehlbach does our myectomy surgery. 
and uh, Greg did an extra year of cardiothoracic surgical training at Cleveland Clinic, which is where he participated in a lot of myectomy surgery, but he's been doing them independently for a good 25 years now. Uh, and uh, also Mark Wiley. Uh, Mark is now president of our group, so he's no longer involved in a day-to-day -day way in terms of seeing patients because he's got too many meetings. He sees patients. He doesn't see a lot of HCM patients. He doesn't see new HCM patients. But he went to Germany, trained with the world expert, and, and does a great job for us on alcohol septal ablation. So I think we have all those tools available. And I guess I should mention that uh, my background is in electrophysiology. So uh, I cover some of the EP bases. And uh, Lisa, I think back to you. Fantastic. Um, I, yeah, it, it has been. I was just trying to go through the years. It has been a good 19, 20 years at least that that we met. And um, I think you can remember one of my very first trips out to, to see you in the center. Um, I bought red shoes because I was going to Kansas. And then that kind of became a signature thing that I've carried all these years. People expect me to wear red shoes when I go to conferences because I started it when I went to Kansas. Um, Dorothy's shoes were cuter than mine. Okay, so I am going, to, I'm working off of a laptop, people. I normally have multiple screens. So give me a second and I will get my PowerPoint up and running. Um, which site is it? This one. Don't normally give multiple talks in a day, but this is my um, this is my third talk today. Uh, let's see, big hearted, big hearted, big hearted. Is that the one? Is that the one? Yes, that's the one. Sorry, guys. I'm I'm a spoiled girl who works on multiple screens. You're seeing my screen now, correct? Okay, fabulous. All right, so. Thank you all for your time and attention this evening. If you're very interested in seeing a lot of um, information from me about the HCMA, I would encourage you to go watch some of the other Big Hearted. I kind of cover different topics in each, and I'm going to go a little quickly tonight uh, because I really want to give the stage to our, our partners at KU, um, and they'll be, um, they'll be taking most of the items Tonight, uh, I do want to take a moment to thank the sponsors of the Big Hearted Warrior Tour. Without them, we wouldn't be able to do the work that we do. So Boston Scientific, Invitae, Bristol Myers Squibb, and Cytokinetics have been our longstanding partners. There is um, a new partner, which is Tanaya Therapeutics. Uh, they're not on the slide here. My apologies to Tanaya. They kind of came on mid-year. So um, he'll be on the next slide. Sorry about that. Uh, but without all of their assistance, we wouldn't get very far. And um, it's, a, it's an interesting space to be in, working with pharmaceutical companies and biotech companies and testing companies that are providing critical services to the community. Um, I've been really pleasantly surprised the last two, three years with how much they want to support education and awareness among patients and clinicians. So uh, bravo to our, our sponsors and our partners. We're never going to go anywhere independently as an organization or as a center. This is a collective and we all have to pull together. Uh, so tonight we're going to be talking about sudden cardiac risk uh, stratification. Um, and what we're talking about there is how to identify those who are at high risk for cardiac arrhythmias and protecting them with appropriate devices and therapies. We're going to be talking about imaging and probably one of my favorite topics, why center of excellence care matters so deeply, especially when it comes to imaging. Medical therapy, Mavic Hampton, and advanced heart failure. So myosin inhibitors are new to the space. Um, we're going to, we've been talking about them pretty much since the start of the Big Hearted Warrior Tour, first in concept and clinical trial, and now in practical application for the obstructed population. Um, I come off a couple of conferences this weekend, which I'll talk about in the this weekend and this this month, where more clinical trials are coming. There's going to be more tools in our toolbox. Everything's not going to fit every patient. So you have to be patient, patience, and find the thing that fits right for you. And it's not always a one size fits all. 
Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about genetics, and I'm very excited to talk about genetics because I just visited an incredibly cool thing this week. Um, I'll talk about that in a minute. And Barbara's going to give you some contact information, and then we'll do Q&A. So that's kind of the outline. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm kind of breaking down my talk into a couple of pieces, and I'm going to be quick here just to make sure y'all know how we can be there to support you at the HCMA. <laughs> and I'm having a little cold, which was a really bad cold last week. And so I apologize for my coughing. Um, as part of the goals and objectives of the HCMA, we want to educate people about HCM symptoms and their treatments, as well as medical providers. And I just wanted to bring up a couple of items here. How do we do that? Like it's, it sounds like a nice little bullet point, but how is it actually practically applied in everyday work to the HCMA? <clears throat> Number one, we do Tales from the Heart, which is a podcast and you can join us tomorrow morning. We have a podcast. I'll be podcasting from my hotel room again. Um, we also, I'll be meeting next week with um, a reporter, a writer. Her name is Rosemary um, Gibson. She wrote a book called China RX, and it is about the generic drug crisis that we're in, but nobody wants to talk about, um, and how generic drugs are not necessarily what you think they are, and how to understand the landscape that we're in. Um, the Big Hard Warrior Tour is one way to educate, but we also have our office staff and our office services. So we have an intake process, a navigation process. It's one-on-one -on -one education. And we also have HCM Academy, which is professional education, which in 2023 will be retooled to be a twice a month, same podcast or same webinar issued twice a month, one to the European population and time zone and one to the US. So stay tuned for more information on that. Um, the thing I really wanted to spend some time in doing a deep dig on today is why I want you all to talk to Julie and meet Julie. Um, and that is because we are about to embark finally on the deployment of a really important project for the HCMA. Through the Legislative Advocacy Committee, which is named for Elizabeth T. McNamee, um, we have created the Healthy Cardiac Monitoring Act. This is a piece of legislation. Um, somebody's trying to open my door. I'm in a hotel. That was a little sketchy. Sorry, I think they had the wrong door because they've moved on now. Um, the Healthy Cardiac Monitoring Act will do a very simple thing that sounds complicated, but it's, it's not. The pre-participation screening physical form for student athletes has 14 points. There's some questions and there's some physical attributes that a physician would look for. The Healthy Cardiac Monitoring Act uses this same 14 point screening for heart disease, provides training to pediatricians and family practitioners about the diseases that they're looking for, and helps families identify those who are at risk and lets those physicians make referrals to cardiac evaluation to determine if there's anything that needs action. With this very simple legislation, we're not adding to the burden to the healthcare community. We're really not adding to cost to the healthcare community. What we are adding is the opportunity for families to discuss their heart health history as well as symptoms that might be present in a child. We start with a child because there is a legislated requirement for a well child examination to be covered by insurance. So we're not adding, we're add, adding cost or complexity. We're adding conversation points, but you have to do this legislatively. So we have picked a number of states where we feel we have a good shot of getting this passed relatively quickly. And we're going to need some action items here. And those action items include engaging those lawmakers to have them understand what's going on. So how can you all help? Um, you can go to our website and you can sign up to be a legislative advocacy volunteer. And what will that do? Like real practical, like what do we need from you? We're gonna provide you with some training, which is kind of what I just said, but at a slightly deeper level. And you'll learn what the ask is. At different levels, the ask changes. So the first ask is, we need a bill number. After we get a bill number, we need co-sponsors. After we get co-sponsors, we need to get it into committee. After we get it into committee, we need to get it onto the floor. 
Once we get it onto the floor, then we need everybody to vote for it. Those are the steps. If you think about the whole process and that we want to do at least 15 states, that's a lot. But if you start with one phone call and one engagement and one conversation, then we start the ball rolling. And if everybody does a little bit of a lift, we can move this pretty easily. So you're going to contact your elected officials. We're going to give you call banking. Easy. You can send emails through our system called UJOIN. Just put your name and address in, send an email, it goes to your legislator. We want you to use social media. We want you, if you want, to share your personal experience with HCM to the level that you're comfortable in doing so. And if you don't want to share your personal story in the public, you can just say you're a volunteer to the organization and you don't need to share personal. So it's what matters to you and how you want to engage. But we are going to need some sweat equity. We're going to need that time from people to make those phone calls and make those engagements. You do not have to wait until we're working on a state that you live in. You can help lift another state and they will help lift your state and so on and so on and so on. So you don't have to wait for your state to come up on the list. Um, it's easy to do. It's actually fun. I know that sounds a little strange, but you're engaging, you're having conversations. We have a great team that you can work with. If you want to give us an hour a week, great. If you can give three hours a week, fantastic. If you can give an hour every other week, that's okay. A little bit of time. If once we train you, you're going you're to get the buck. You're going to want to be in. And then once we get that passed and we, we start moving, there might be opportunities for you to go to the state house and share your story, provide testimony, sit in the gallery as we're giving testimony. You get as involved as you want, but it all starts with just saying, let me, let me make a couple phone calls. So we want to keep it real easy, but we're going to definitely need your help. Um, so you can reach Julie at julie at 4hcm.org. You can go to the website and sign up as a volunteer. You can learn more on the website. And I hope, I hope I got at least two of you to say, yes, I think I want to do that. So there we go. Um, I want to just talk a little bit about some of our other projects. We have live support groups, discussion groups online every week. So if you have HCM and you feel a little bit alone, we've got you. We've got lots of support there. We have a very broad social media network, as many of you know. Our private Facebook group is approaching 10,000 members. That's amazing. Um, but it's a private group, so it doesn't show up on your, H on your Facebook feed. So you can have a private conversation there. And for those of you who are unaware, we finally have um, gotten enough money into the Lori Fund, which provides micro travel grants to families going to HCM Center of Excellence Care. So if you live a bit far away from a center of excellence, maybe you're on the other side of the state in Kansas, and it's, it's a financial hardship for you to get to the center because gas money and hotels, you can apply for a grant. And we'll give you up to $600 a year to get to your center of excellence. So do not be afraid to apply. Very lovely people have donated money to make it easier for you and your families to get HCM care. So please apply. The, the grants are available now. You can get that information on the website. Um, where are our centers of excellence? Well, here is a map and you see a dot. All right, maybe my dot in Kansas is a little low but it's Kansas. I got that far. So sorry, Kansas. I just noticed you're a little low. Um, so this is our map. Uh, we have 47 centers now. I'm sorry, this is a little bit out of date, um, but we are adding a few other programs. We have 17 under review. Uh, some of them we've already been to and we're in process of evaluation. And hopefully um, over the next couple of years, you'll see us moving into areas that a little blank right now. So fingers crossed for some advances in HCM care in centers around the country soon. And we're gonna, we're just working on some details to recognize Toronto and other international programs. The process is a little bit different, but we will be uh, hopefully getting out to other countries as well. None of this happens in a silo. If you've noticed over the past, maybe three or four years, the HCMA seems to have gotten a lot bigger. And that's because we have more partners. Um, why do we have more partners? Well, let's be honest. 
There wasn't an economic model in HCM care up until recently when we had a labeled indication drug. And then all the manufacturers, drug manufacturers said, wait a minute, maybe we could do something for HCM too. And now the trials are coming out and thereby everybody wants to find the patients. So how do they find the patients? They help support us to grow so we can help more patients and we provide more medical education. And we have a lot of partners that we're doing medical education with as well as patient education. So working with HSFA, working with Women Heart, PCNA, uh, who's not on here, the Arrhythmia Alliance, the American Heart Association, the American College of Cardiology. We now have co-branded materials with AHA. We've worked on a lot of projects with ACC. I'm a member of the Global, or we're a member of the Global Heart Hub, and we are in the cardiomyopathy and heart failure um, uh, committees. I, I am a board member to the new HCM Society, which is a professional society that is just getting started. So we still haven't fully defined all the actions of the society, but stay tuned for more information on that. And we have all of our wonderful um, corporate sponsors that help provide the funding to make all of this possible. So together, we're really changing the face of HCM. I'm working on building out international programs. We're looking for motivated patient and KOL uh, physician leaders in these communities uh, so that we can do what we did over in Sweden. Uh, oops, my Swedish slide is missing. Um, we've created our first international um, organization. Uh, we, they're part of the HCM International Program, but they're named the HCM Swedish Society. They are a standalone nonprofit organization. We provide oversight and guidance for them as a mentorship uh, situation. They're gonna do things a little different than us, which is great because Sweden is a little different than the United, <coughs> excuse me, than the United States. And uh, we're really looking forward to other countries coming on board with us as well. Um, none of this happens in a vacuum. Uh, not only do we need our sponsors and our partners, but we need an amazing staff and I am blessed and lucky to have that. So I just wanna give a moment of acknowledgement to everybody here and uh, Olivia, darling, you're missing from the slide. So I have, we have a new staff member, Olivia Esposito, who will be doing our marketing graphics and she will be responsible for the HCM Academy work. So um, she's not on the slide, so shout out to Olivia. We had over 100 volunteers last year do work for the HCMA, whether it was joining a focus group, helping with the legislative committee, um, being on one of our other committees, <clears throat> or providing their stories so that we can use to, their stories to elevate the understanding of HCM. Every one of those volunteers we appreciate. And we have a brand new volunteer appreciation program that we're starting. So for every hour that you work, you work towards different goals and you'll get Facebook frames that are special and only you'll be able to use them. Um, you'll get gifts and awards as, as you build up. And next October, this is late breaking news, uh, we will be going back to our first in-person meeting um, for that weekend. And if you have enough volunteer hours, you can earn your tuition to the program and to the Unmask the Great Masquerader Ball Part 2, which will happen that night. So <clears throat> am I bribing people to volunteer? Absolutely. Do we need your help? Absolutely. Do we really appreciate you even considering volunteering for us? Absolutely. So I just wanted to grovel a little bit and, and dangle things so that maybe you want to come play with us in New Jersey next October. So I want to th say thank you to all the team at KU, our staff, our contractors at the HCMA, our board, our partners, our sponsors, our donors, our volunteers, and to Brandy. And for those who don't know, Brandy was my heart donor's name. And in February of 2017, I left the HCM family in some ways in my heart, and I got a donor heart, and she's doing beautifully, and I'm very appreciative. So sign up to be an organ donor. You never know when you can be somebody's hero. And um, I'm going to hand it back to Lauren. So, Lauren. Okay. Your turn. <laughs> and I am going to... Try and figure out if I know how to. Green chair. 
I'm cracking here with my bottle. Is that nope. popping up? Nope. Nope. So you want to do the screen share, the little green button in the bottom? Ah, that one. Okay. And that one. Now is it there? Aha. Now it is there. Okay. I'm going to disappear for a little bit. Okay. So the heart's job is a plumbing job, but it pumps blood through individual heartbeats. And each heartbeat is initiated by a little electrical signal. And if that electrical signal gets messed up, then sometimes just very minor issues ensue or no issues at all. But sometimes it can be life-threatening. The two big arrhythmias that we deal with in HCM uh, are atrial fibrillation, which I'm really not going to talk about, uh, and sudden cardiac arrest. And... So sudden cardiac arrest, and a lot of times people say they had a heart attack, but a heart attack is different than cardiac arrest. A heart attack is really a plumbing thing. It's a blocked artery and heart muscle dies. Cardiac arrest is typically due to a very fast rhythm in the lower chambers of the heart, the ventricles, uh, either sustained VT or VF. And basically the heart is going so fast that it doesn't actually pump at all. It just kind of quivers like a bowl of jelly. You don't get blood supply to your brain, you pass out. And if that situation is not rectified pretty quickly, uh, unfortunately it's game over. And, and this is really an electrical accident, but some people are more prone to an electrical accident than others. So there isn't anybody that gets a guarantee that they won't have a cardiac arrest, but generally uh, that, that risk is extremely small, sort of for the average person walking down the street, that risk is less than one in 1,000 per year. And for most patients with HCM, that risk is also low, but there, there are 20 to maybe 25% of HCM patients who are at increased risk of a cardiac arrest. Now, one thing I want to point out is that if somebody is what we call phenotypically normal, their, their echo looks okay, maybe they've had an MRI, which also looks okay, uh, we don't think those people are at increased risk for cardiac arrest. And so whether you're in a family that's gene positive and you're a gene carrier, or whether you're gene negative and you don't know, you know the family's gene negative and you don't know if, if the gene is, is in you, uh, if your echo looks good, we don't worry about a risk of cardiac arrest. There are several risk factors for, uh, for cardiac arrest. And the first and perhaps most obvious is that if you've had an episode of cardiac arrest, which you've survived, you're at increased risk for a recurrent episode. Uh, secondly is if you've had a family history of cardiac arrest, and that's generally considered to be one or more first degree relatives. So mom, dad, sister, brother, child. Uh, and generally before age 50, because you know, if grandpa dies suddenly at 75, I'm not saying that couldn't be HCM, but it, at that age, it's much more likely that it's other things uh, like garden, coronary artery disease. Uh, and unfortunately, I've got something covering up my slide here, so I can't see all of it. It's completely visible. Not to me. Well, the good news is they can see it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
what does this one say? Left ventricular, help well, me. I'll help, Lauren. I do this list all the time. So the major risk factors, personal history of aborted cardiac arrest, family history, ventricular wall thickness of 30 ah, millimeters greater. Than greater. Three centimeters. Okay. Passing out. Uh, and again, anybody can pass out and people with HCM can pass out from all of the non-significant reasons that anybody else passes out from. But so you have to take a careful history and we generally only care about fairly recent syncope, which is our fancy word for passing out. Because if somebody tells me they passed out 22 years ago, I don't really get very concerned about that. Uh, the next, next risk factor is non-sustained ventricular tachycardia. So that's a short run, a few beats of rapid heartbeat in the lower chambers. And, and this is one that is a little tricky sometimes because then it, it's how often does that happen? How long are the runs? How fast are the runs? When this risk factor was first identified, technology was such that a monitor was done for 24 hours and the feeling was that it was three or more runs in 24 hours. But now a lot of times we monitor people for two weeks or a month or longer and somebody may have one three beat run in a month. And, and that's probably not in and of itself a reason to get a defibrillator. Late gadolinium enhancement is one of the newer risk factors and just clinically, I found it to be a pretty potent one. But this is something that we do as part of a cardiac MRI. And basically it's a way of looking at fibrosis or scarring within the heart muscle. And if there is fibrosis and scarring in the heart muscle, it tends to slow the electrical signal getting through the heart muscle it tends to let it kind of wander around and double back on itself. And it makes it more likely that you can have one of these arrhythmias. Um, next, we have uh, an ejection fraction less than 50%. And people with HCM are normally hyperdynamic. So their ejection fraction is usually greater than 60%, often 65, 70% or greater. And so if the ejection fraction has been in that range and drops to 50%, that means the heart's under a lot of stress and some, some potentially bad things are happening. And then in those patients with apical HCM, which is a relatively uncommon variant of HCM in this country, for instance, compared to Japan, where it seems to be more common, but if you have apical HCM and what's called an apical aneurysm, then again, you are at risk uh, for uh, a potential cardiac arrest. Now, the Europeans look at a couple of other risk factors that we don't tend to really look at directly in the US. And one is if there's a left ventricular outflow tract gradient, how big is it? And another is how big is the left atrium? If the left atrium gets enlarged, that potentially increases risk a bit. And in general, and, and nothing's absolute, but beyond the age of 50, certainly beyond the age of 60, 65, we tend to be less concerned about the risk of cardiac arrest related to HCM. Uh, and, and basically the way I think of it is that if you have bad HCM that puts you at risk for a cardiac arrest, by age 50, that's probably shown up. Uh, and, and so if you've survived to a certain age, you're probably at, at lower risk than if you were you know, 25. Now, if I just pull a number out of the air, which is a 2% annual risk of having a cardiac arrest, I can tell you, because I've done this, when I sit down with a 90-year-old and said, well, your risk is 2% a year, so between now and when you're 95, that's a 10% risk, they kind of look at me like I'm silly, and they go, you know, 
I don't care about a 10% risk of dropping dead. I'm 90. I, I don't think I'm going to get to 95 anyway. That's not a big deal to those people in general. Uh, everybody's different, obviously. But if you're a 20-year-old with that same 2% annual risk, and your risk of dying from other things is really pretty darn low, and you do the numbers and you say, okay, by the time I'm 50, my risk of having a cardiac arrest is 60%, that's a very significant problem that people generally want to try and address. Now, how do we address this risk? Medication might help around the edges, but in and of itself is not adequate protection. A myectomy may be of some benefit, but again, in and of itself is not adequate protection. You have to look over the patient as a whole and not just focus on what's going on electrically, but basically the way we manage the risk of cardiac arrest is with an ICD or an implantable cardiac defibrillator. Now, sometimes the decision about putting in a defibrillator seems pretty straightforward, but for the most part, there's a lot of judgment involved and it involves, it means you sit down and talk to the patients about the risks of not having a defibrillator, the risks of having a defibrillator, what are the benefits, and, and what, what we now call shared decision-making. Uh, for most of my career, it just means sitting down and talking to your patient. Uh, but now it's got a new name, shared decision-making. And in general, if you've got one risk factor, this is a dis uh, discussion that needs to happen. Now, at this point, there are two types of FDA-approved defibrillators. Um, and on the left side of the screen is the version that's been around for about 30 years. And that's called a transvenous ICD because there's a lead that goes into a vein up in the shoulder region, follows that vein down into the heart. That lead gives you a direct connection to the heart, connects to the defibrillator. And that device is always watching your heart. Uh, and it's basically just watching and it's not really doing anything. But if your heart speeds up into a life-threatening arrhythmia, it can either pace you out or shock you out. And depending on your needs and individual's needs and, and the type of the device that we implant, that device may pace the heart and, and help maintain a proper rate if the rate gets too slow at times. But basically, this is a device to, it, it's life insurance. The other option, which is about 10 years old, is the subcutaneous defibrillator. And this device is kind of low in the left armpit. It is under the skin and under the fatty layers. Both these devices sit on top of the muscle outside the chest. The difference here with the lead is that it is tunneled under the skin and under the fatty layers, but again, on top of the muscle outside the chest. And, and so there's nothing that's actually touching the heart. And there are technical reasons why one or the other may be preferred uh, in a given individual. So in hypertrophs who end up with a defibrillator based on you know, follow-up from various centers, the incidence of getting treated for a cardiac arrest is about 3.2% per year. So we're pretty good at identifying patients that need a defibrillator and, and you know, you may have a defibrillator and it doesn't go off for 10 or 15 years, and then one day it, it saves your life, or you may have a defibrillator for 30 years and it just sits there. Um, in HCM patients, they're classified as low risk and no ICD is recommended. The risk of cardiac arrest is not really different than it is in the general population. Uh, it's, it's one in a thousand per year or less. And defibrillators are not going to prevent every sudden death, but they're very effective. And so the risk of a cardiac arrest turning into a fatal event is less than one in 1,000 per year. 
So it's, it's good treatment. It's highly reliable treatment. Uh, and I think that's it for me. Okay, I, I omitted to tell our, uh, oops, sorry, hotel lighting. Uh, I omitted to tell our uh, viewers that they can use the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen to issue any questions. Um, our faculty can answer them throughout the evening, or I will address them live at the conclusion of a, a presentation. So um, I'm gonna ask the rest of our faculty to come back on screen for a moment. And um, we will then have a couple of follow-up questions. So I'm gonna start the follow-up questions with the difference between SICD and ICD. Um, we know that historically we were putting leads in the heart and we preferred not to. So we have SICDs now so that we don't have to put those leads in the heart. Could you talk a little bit about how you make some decisions about who should get which device in this day and age? And then can you hypothesize as when the lead list devices might be available? Uh, I have not found predicting what the FDA is going to do to be very uh, rewarding. And so I don't think I'm, you, if, I, I don't think I'm, I'm going to try and hazard a guess as when the next generation of devices may come in. Uh, but I think that, and, and when I started putting defibrillators in, which was 1986, uh, you had to open someone's chest and put big patches on the heart and put in a device that lasted two years. So when we got to transvenous devices that lasted four or five years and now can last 10 or 12 years, uh, these were pretty miraculous advances. Um, I put these devices in for a long time. I don't do procedures anymore. Uh, over the course of three decades, I took upwards of 3,000 leads out of people. So I know a lot about taking leads out of people. And uh, everything else being equal, a young, healthy individual, if a sub -Q defibrillator can work, a sub-Q defibrillator is really going to be my first, second, and third choices. Now, sometimes for technical reasons, which have to do with the signal that the device is going to see, you may not be able to do a sub-Q device because the signal that you're getting isn't from inside the heart. It's a surface signal, and sometimes the device can have trouble seeing that cleanly. And, and recognizing the rate and rhythm properly. Uh, sometimes you've got a patient who needs pacing. And if you're gonna, I, it generally doesn't make sense to me. I wouldn't wanna put in a pacemaker to treat the slow rhythms and then a defibrillator to treat the fast rhythms. And you have to worry about whether the devices are gonna confuse each other. So sometimes you need pacing, but if the sub-Q defibrillator is technically appropriate, I think that's the way to go. Okay. Um, we have a question from the audience and I'm going to read it as it appears. What is an example of a, a, a rhythm that an ICD cannot correct other than a heart attack? So I think this is a great educational moment to discuss apples and oranges, also known as the differences between a myocardial infarction and a cardiac arrest. Okay, so as, as I, a heart attack, what doctors call an MI or a myocardial infarction is when you block an artery and heart muscle starts dying. And that results in heart damage and a weaker heart muscle. Now, in the acute phases of a heart attack, the heart can become electrically unstable and you can have sustained ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. So a heart attack can lead to a cardiac arrest on an electrical basis. Um, but, but they're different phenomena. Um, now, one, again, the other arrhythmia that I mentioned uh, in, that's pretty common in HCM is atrial fibrillation. 
And a defibrillator is not meant to treat atrial fibrillation. It's basically going to watch atrial fibrillation. Now, if you go into atrial fibrillation and your heart gets super fast, depending on how your device is programmed, you could get a shock that would treat your AFib. But in general, we don't want to treat AFib that way. And the devices are not really, they're not intended to do that. So these devices are intended to treat fast rhythms in the lower chambers that start in the lower chambers. And they're also, they, they have, all of the transvenous devices have some pacing function. Uh, and so they can prevent very slow rhythms. If we need, if slow rhythms are a problem, we're gonna put in two leads, a lead in the upper chambers or atria. Uh, but, you know, a lot of patients with HCM, a single chamber defibrillator is the best fit if they need a lead, uh, a intravascular lead. So I've been involved with um, a little project that the American Heart Association is working on about device infections. And um, we met earlier this year and issued a report. Uh, Bruce Wilkoff and Larry Epstein are involved in this initiative. And I want to get your perspective on if you have a, a lead that needs to come out. So we have a lot of devices that have been in there a long time, right? Um, if you have a, a lead that has to come out or a lead that needs to be replaced, um, would you extract and how do you make the decision to extract a lead or not to extract a lead or to just drop another one in? Uh, no? That there, there isn't one simple answer to that. Uh, in general, the younger and healthier a patient is and the longer they're going to be around, the less I want to start filling their blood and heart with what, what if you're leaving it behind, it's trash. Uh, that's not a very sophisticated term, uh, but that's kind of what, what we tend to call that. And, and so, you know, if I've got an 89 year old that needs something, I'm going to try and make that as low risk as possible because I don't need a 30 year plan. But if I've got a 40 year old and I do what's safest and easiest today, which means the least that I can get away with. That may work well today, but it's going to make things potentially much more difficult down the line. And so personally, I'm not a big fan of having multiple ICD leads in people. Um, I, I'm not, you know, hard and fast you know, nobody should ever have an abandoned lead in them. But I think if you're playing the long game with a relatively young, relatively healthy person, you then you're going to be pretty aggressive about getting leads out. But that means you need somebody who's good at doing it in a center that's used to doing it with surgical backup if you need it, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I think extraction can be done very, very safely in the right hands, so. So you just said with surgical backup, I, I would like our audience to understand why you might need surgical backup for a lead removal. So leads inside the body, some places in the body that lead is just floating free. And again, this is all transvenous leads. Because if the lead is subcutaneous, it's just sitting in some fatty tissues. And the tools we have to get a lead out of a vein, you're going to get a lead out of the fatty tissues real quick, really is easy, virtually no risk. I can't ever say no risk, but virtually no risk. But if a lead is in a vein, some places it's just floating around, but some places it's up against the wall of that blood vessel. And if it's up against the wall of the blood vessel, scar tissue, fibrous tissue is going to go around the lead and basically lock it down, glue it down. And so you can't just pull it out 
you've got to break up all that scar tissue. And in breaking up that scar tissue, what you don't want to do is put a hole in a blood vessel or put a hole in the heart itself. And then you have somebody who is bleeding to death internally. Uh, so there is a potential for fatal complications or a complication that would require immediately opening up the chest. Uh, and when I say immediate, you're talking like within minutes. You know, if you've got a 15 minute delay in opening somebody's chest in this situation, they may not make it. I mean, you really need to be on top of your game. So, uh, but again, right tools, right person, thinking through what they're doing. I think the risk of those things are very, very small, but they're never zero. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, we got another question coming in. Is there a way to visualize fibrotic tissue prior to surgery for an ICD extraction? Visualize necrotic? Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm stuck with the content on the screen. Yeah. Um, I, guess, yeah. I guess the question would be, do you see how the lead is scarred in? You can get some idea of how the lead is scarred in looking at the x-ray in terms of what's the course of the lead and where my, is it a, look to be against a wall of a blood vessel? Where does it look to be against the heart? You can do a CT scan and get perhaps more of an idea. You're not really gonna see soft tissue around a lead but if there is calcified tissue around the lead, you can probably see some calcium. Uh, sometimes you'll see a lead that seems to be going outside a blood vessel or doing something very strange, which is not common, but uh, you know that's gonna give you great pause. Uh, and then just when you get into a case, you, all of these leads, you can put what's called a stylet down the lead. And if you put a lot of curl on the stylet and just put it down the lead, some places you'll see the lead wiggle all around and move freely. And some places the lead doesn't move at all because it's stuck down. So that can tell you where your attachment points are before you get in and start working on it. Okay, we have a very good question and a very interesting one. Um, Question is, to what degree should patients be concerned with selecting the manufacturer of their ICD? Noting that in July, the Department of Justice fined Biotronics for improper payment to physicians. And can I say I was very happy to see them do that because I've always thought that they were an ounce sketchy in some of the things I saw them doing. But your point, any comments from any of the faculty on that one? So again, having worked in this space for a long time, uh, it, it, it's a lot cleaner space than it used to be. I mean, all of the stuff would, you know, like now, I mean, let's see. So I, I used to have a thousand pens from different drug companies. Drug companies have not been able to hand me a pen for probably 15 or 20 years that could potentially bribe me. I don't, I, I, it's, it's like, I hate to think I could be bought for a 29 cent pen, <laughs> but, but you never know. Um, but, but I, I think by and large, the industry is clean, but that doesn't, you know, those types of influences, but that doesn't mean that there aren't still economic factors. Um, you know, unfortunately, every company has had recalls of one kind or another, a device that has a problem, a lead that has a problem. Uh, one of the things we've tried to do is always have access to more than one manufacturer because the companies always want you They say, we'll give you a little better price if you'll exclusively deal with us. Well, I don't want to exclusively deal with one company because I want the best device for my 
patient. And historically, we've used almost no biotronic except a particular pacemaker that has a particular role that's not related to HCM. Uh, and, you know, right, at, there's reasons, again, there's a, one company right now that makes the subcutaneous defibrillator. Uh, and so if you're going to go sub Q, you've got one option. There may be other companies that uh, will have options coming up pretty soon, but not right now. Uh, so I think you kind of have to rely on your physician and you can ask, by all means, ask. So I would yeah. offer that um, I had a device malfunction on me from a manufacturer. Um, and my daughter had a problem with a different manufacturer. So devices are different. Don't don't think that every device from every manufacturer is just, you know, an add-on. Sometimes it's new technology from a manufacturer that didn't have a good thing going on here, but they have a really good thing here. And we've evolved over the years from just single pacemakers, single lead pacemakers to dual lead, to dual lead pacer defibs to to buy the devices. Um, I find Boston Scientific and Medtronic both in equal standing. They both have the same number of recalls. I think um, Boston Sci affected more people in the number of devices, but still my favorite line at, from 2005 and the lead problems we had with Fidelis, et cetera, was devices are man-made devices. If women made them, maybe things would be just a little bit. No, only kidding, only kidding, only kidding. They're man-made devices. They're like toasters, but fancy. Did your toaster malfunction occasionally? Probably not, but it could. So you got to remember that we're trusting technology to a certain degree. And you're also trusting the ethics of some of these companies. They've each had their day of questionable activity since the 70s on, uh, but we evolve. I will be honest, Biotronic always engaging with them was very weird. And I saw them do some things that I thought was were highly questionable. So when they got investigated, I was not surprised. And hopefully they have changed their behavior. That's all we can hope. Okay, Lauren, you wanna introduce our next speaker? Uh, Jared Kvapel is our next speaker. And uh, Jared is our cardiac uh, fellowship program director. Uh, a busy clinician, a busy echocardiographer, and uh, busy with a lot of HCM patients. So, Jared, take it away. Thanks, Lauren, for the nice introduction. Let me try to share my screen and uh, let me know if it's working okay. Are we good? You are good. And I'm Thank in full, full screen view, not presentation view. Full screen view. You're awesome. Thanks, Jared. All right. Thank you, Lisa, and uh, thanks for, for being here and helping us organize this. Um, this is my second go around. Um, as, as Lisa said, we did a, um, a what, I, what I thought to be a really nice program back in 2019, which turned out to be the, the last live program. I just learned that uh, tonight. So I'm um, excited to be back and uh, in a space that uh, we're all passionate about. So uh, welcome. I'm gonna talk a little bit about cardiac imaging. I'm gonna try to show um, as many pictures as possible. Um, so you can get an idea of what we're looking at, what we're looking for. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about why a center of excellence uh, is critical. So, um, okay. So um, kind of the echocardiographic diagnosis of, of HCM is left ventricular hypertrophy or um, thickening that's greater than 15 millimeters uh, typically, it's asymmetric, and I'll show you what I mean by that, uh, much more than symmetric thickening, uh, or it's much more thick on one side than, than diffuse thickness, although you can see either pattern. Um, and that is in the absence of any other uh, cardiovascular or systemic disease, which can be associated with um, left ventricular hypertrophy or thickening of the wall. And we kind of call those mimickers of, of HCM. And and some common ones, there's some uh, glycogen storage diseases, things like Fabre's disease, um, uh, just having long-standing high blood pressure for years and years. Um, 
you know, just like the bodybuilders on Venice Beach, their their muscles get big. And uh, if the heart is pumping against a very high blood pressure for years and years and years, uh, the muscle also gets big. And uh, that's a that's that's a bit different than than HCM. Um, and we'll talk about that. Um, these are some different patterns and their respective prevalence, um, as well as gene positivity. Um, so you'll see the two on the left are going to be your most common, and that's that kind of asymmetrical septal thickening uh, that we see so many times. Um, and then as you get further here to the right of the slide, you'll see um, kind of more diffuse thickening as well as, um, and Dr. Berenbaum mentioned this as well, the apical variant of, of HCM, and I'll, and I'll show you some, some echo pictures of that as well. Um, um, Dr. Bar and I'm going to expand on a lot of the, the, the points that Dr. Berenbaum made. So um, we do screening and, and that screen is predominantly to help uh, risk stratify patients um, in terms of the potential for sudden cardiac uh, death and, and therefore implantation of an ICD. And um, this is from the 2020 um, American Cards of Cardiology guidelines and um, their recommendations for screening. And, and most of us on, well, all of us on this call today uh, are, are predominantly treat adults um, with cardiovascular disease. And so, so and, th and this is looking at patients that are um, what we would call phenotypically negative uh, predominantly, um, uh, but may have a gene positive in themselves or in um, one of their family members or unknown gene status. And so we're, we're looking at doing an echocardiogram every three to five years and that can be adjusted based on the, the clinician's suspicion or, or the patient's reported symptoms. You know, if, if a patient of mine is uh, known to have a family history of HCM um, with a negative gene mutation, meaning that the person with, H, with HCM did not have a positive genetic mutation, we're still going to screen their family members. And, and if, that, if that patient of mine comes to me and says, you know, for the last three months, I've had this new shortness of breath, well, we're gonna we're gonna investigate that a little further, and so you can you know the clinician can always alter these these gui these uh, guidelines, and this is a kind of a, an algorithmic picture of of the things that Dr. Berenbaum was going through, and uh, kind of in a green light, yellow light, red light here. So green is that an ICD is always recommended. Um, you'll see in the middle that there's are some of our high risk um, features which Dr. Berenbaum went through, in which an ICD is is reasonable to consider. And then lastly, if you have none of these risk factors, no what we call high risk features, then an ICD is definitely not indicated because uh, as uh, Dr. Berenbaum alluded to as well, you can cause harm by, by having uh, too many leads, leads for too long. There's, there's various things that if you don't need to have a defibrillator, you shouldn't have a defibrillator. Conversely, if, if there are high risk features present, um, it's, it's generally recommended that we would consider that and have a discussion. That's that kind of shared uh, decision-making model. So. Uh, I'll just point out that that three of those um, high risk features here, um, if my mouse is working, you know, massive LVH, apical aneurysm, as well as ejection fraction less than 50%, which is referring to the overall heart's pumping function. You really need cardiac imaging to be able to um, define those features. So imaging is very important. So let me show you some pictures here now. So this is a normal echo. Um, um, these are kind of normal uh, wall thickness here. Um, I'll point out this mitral valve that the way it opens and closes is what we would consider normal. Um, and then this is what's called the aortic valve. So blood moves this way, comes back from the, from the lungs where it's re received oxygen, comes into this main chamber, and then it pumped out the aorta to where it's distributed to the rest of the body. I don't have color on that. I apologize. Uh, this is uh, the same heart, just from a different angle. So now you're seeing um, this is the main pumping chamber. This is that same mitral valve, we call it. And this is that uh, top chamber or the aorta, which is a uh, uh, atrium, excuse me, which is the receiving chamber. Um, this is uh, just a little kind of cartoon uh, uh, describing some of the symptoms that patients can get, as well as uh, some of the potential mechanism for those symptoms. So this is that thickening of the septum or asymmetric, asymmetric septal hypertrophy. Um, the mitral valve, you can commonly have systolic anterior motion where the valve gets kind of sucked up into um, where blood is trying to exit from, and that causes turbulence as well as that increased pressure gradient that we talk about. And because of the same mechanism, you can actually have blood flow that goes backwards called regurgitation, which is mitral regurgitation because this is the mitral valve. Um, and I'm going to show you some examples of that. So this is a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So you'll notice just without the picture playing, 
there's thickening of the septum. I'm gonna, I want you to watch the mitral valve. It's gonna move towards the septum um, uh, during uh, when the ventricle contracts. And then when I show you these color pictures, notice, um, so we should see what we call laminar flow, but basically when the blood flow is moving out or towards the probe, it should be all orange. When it's moving away, it should be all blue. And you'll notice that there's green color here is there's turbulence of flow as it is ejected from the heart, as well as look over here. And I want you to see that this is that mitral regurgitation, which we talked about. So I'm gonna go and let these play. So there's that thickening and you can see the, what we call hyperdynamic. Uh, Dr. Baerbaum mentioned that as well, where almost the entire, as opposed to that earlier heart I showed, you know, almost the entire cavity of the heart is, is contracting here, which seems like it would be a good thing, but in actuality it's not because um, that creates a lot of increased pressure within the heart. And so here's that color picture I showed, you know, the turbulence of blood flow as it's ejected out of the heart. That's what we call the, L, the left ventricular outflow tract gradient. And then this blood flow going backwards here is um, a blood flow, which is going back into the left atrium, um, increasing the pressure within uh, that chamber as well as uh, within the lungs. Um, some pictures now, same thing, left chamber here. What, what I wanna point out here on this um, movie is, notice this mitral valve as it moves in, that's that systolic anterior motion. And so I don't have color on this picture, but you would see that turbulent flow because, as a result of that. And then this one is showing the same thing from a slightly different angle is that mitral valve is getting, the, the front leaflet there, anterior leaflet we call it, is getting sucked up into um, the left ventricular outflow tract. These are some still images. Uh, this is showing that massive uh, left ventricular hypertrophy. So this here, from here to here, is all the septum, and it's, it's, um, it's massively enlarged. And, and we talked about so one of the risk factors is if this measurement is 30 millimeters, that, that by itself is a high-risk feature and can could you could consider an ICD in, in that patient. This is the same patient, and uh, that this is that a different view here of that massive septal enlargement. Um, these are those pressure gradients which we measure, and so we're we're measuring the speed of blood flow here. So we get a velocity, and we're measuring it right at that point um, where the blood's exiting through um, the outflow tract. Normal is going to be uh, less than than ten millimeters of mercury. Um, that's the pressure when we do a mathematical equation to get that number. Um, and then um, we'll have the patient do what's called a provocative maneuver. So a Valsalva maneuver, which is like a sneeze or a cough or bearing down. And that increases the pressure um, um, uh, or actually decreases the return of blood flow to the heart very temporarily, um, which then um, can accelerate um, the uh, speed uh, because of there's less blood volume. And so we can get a much higher pressure gradient. So you can see this one was very high at rest, 77 but it became even more pronounced up to 130 millimeters of mercury when, when the patient did what's called a provocative maneuver. This is a, one of those special cases um, on what's called apical HCM. And so the, instead of the thickening being here in the, in the septum, it's down here in what we call the apex of the heart. Um, and, and on the right side here, I'm gonna play both of these, but on the right side, so you, so you can't see it that well um, with what we call a non-contrasted image. And that's why um, many times it's very important, and you can actually see this is an ICD lead. Here you see this bright linear structure, that's an ICD lead. Um, but we use what's called echo contrast, and that's a special um, a sterile protein bubble, if you will, that allows us to um, see the chamber uh, uh, fill much, much easier. And so that's what, so the inside of the chamber is white here, and the muscle's actually gonna be a dark gray or black color. And so I'll let this one play, and you'll see, this is all thickened uh, heart muscle here in what's called apical HCM. And one of the complications of apical HCM, um, which is a high-risk feature as well, is what's called an apical aneurysm, which is an outpouching of this area of the heart. So you can kind of see it here on the non-contrasted image where you see this thick wall here, thick wall, and then there's this outpouching. And that um, uh, has been shown to be a harbinger of a lot of fibrosis and scarring and is, a, is a, many times a, a precursor for dangerous heart rhythms. And you can see it even better here with that echo contrast, what I, what I mentioned before. I'm gonna switch gears kind of uh, quickly here um, and, and talk a little bit about cardiac MRI. Uh, Dr. Berenbaum mentioned that uh, greater than 15% of what we call delayed hyperenhancement on cardiac MRI is a, another uh, independent risk factor in which you may consider um, ICD implantation. And so this is a patient with HCM. Um, these are these are different uh, sections of the same heart. So at different levels, basically, you're seeing the heart at different levels. This is the very tip, what we call the apex. And this is up more towards the base near that mitral valve. And so um, the normal heart in this um, type of study should be this dark black color. Um, this is the inside of the cavity. And you'll see 
as you go through these different slices, there's these areas that are bright, and that's that delayed hyperenhancement, and uh, it's 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 evidence of scar tissue within the heart muscle itself, and that scar tissue um, at the pathologic level is is um, muscle fibers which are kind of disarrayed, they're going the wrong direction, and that provides a, a similar kind of substrate um, for uh, abnormal cardiac rhythms to develop. Uh, I like to point out this. This is uh, two patients um, who are re related to one another, so they're relatives, um, and they both have the exact same gene mutation. And the one on the left here, these three images, um, this is that nice dark black myocardium. You don't see any septal thickening here. Um, and, and so this is, a, this is a, a patient that has a gene positive, but is what we call phenotype negative. And this is an MRI scan from, from the relative of that same patient. You notice they have a thick myocardium. You see these these patchy spots of, of, of scar tissue I'm um, seeing here. So, um, so we're going to continue to monitor this patient on the left with that serial imaging every three to five years, as opposed to this patient on the right should be considered, uh, or at least have a discussion about, you know, should we have an ICD implanted to prevent uh, th those or treat and prevent and more treat those dangerous uh, heart rhythms. Um, one more slide, there's kind of high risk and low risk when it comes to um, MRI findings. This tiny little um, patch of whiteness, right where um, what's called the right ventricle inserts into the left ventricle, this is considered low risk. So, so this type of pattern, um, um, I, I would, if this was the only um, uh, feature, high risk feature present, I would, I would probably counsel against ICD implantation in this patient, as opposed to this patient here who has this uh, diffuse patchiness, much more than 15% of the, of the total myocardium. Um, I, I would counsel towards uh, highly considering ICD in that patient. Uh, the last one I want to talk about is something called strain imaging. And um, this is kind of a measure of stiffness, if you will, is how I would describe it. And it correlates closely with findings on an MRI. And this is um, an echo, this is an ultrasound or an echocardiographic parameter. And this is something that we might see. And, and, and what we, this is a very stereotypical pattern in which you see um, the septum. This is what's called the septum of the, of the left ventricle. And um, it really doesn't move or thicken. It's gotten stiff over time. And that, that coincides, with, if we were to MRI the same patient, we would see that same kind of patchy whiteness on their cardiac MRI scan in that location. So, um, so maybe patient is uh, claustrophobic. Uh, maybe patient uh, has an ICD, which is, which is not compatible with the MRI scanner. Um, this echocardiographic strain imaging is uh, another tool in the toolbox um, in which we can kind of um, help quantify or stratify risk. A few slides here. This is a busy slide. You don't need to read all the words, but the point is, is that um, you can have a referring center. So maybe this is a center out in the community. Um, you have a primary HCM center, and then you have a comprehensive HCM center, such as the University of Kansas Health System. And what we can offer is kind of the full range of everything a patient would need, whether it's related to uh, uh, ICD implantation, such as an electrophysiologist, whether it's like Dr. Roldan or Dr. Shaw, um, where we need to talk about, you know, potential cardiac transplantation or, or other advanced heart failure therapies. Um, Dr. Wiley with alcohol septal ablation, Dr. Muehlbach, who can offer septal myectomy um, uh, at an expertise level. And so, um, yeah, and we do this a lot. We, we um, routinely see patients from, that are referred into us from cardiologists in the community or out in, in uh, central or even West Kansas. And, and we take care of the HCM aspect of their care and then, and then their um, um, other outpatient cardiologist uh, manages um, their other cardiac care. So um, this is a, a, what I think is a nice diagram from the ACC guidelines. And it shows, uh, point out that the, the patient, the HCM patient is at the center, right? Uh, they're at the center of all these uh, specialists and subspecialists. And then, and then you know, surrounding the patient is this shared decision-making model. Um, and so I, I really kind of like that side. Um, uh, throw a shout out to um, Lisa Salzberg and her team there at the HCMA. You know, they're very diligent about how they um, uh, provide this recommendation to centers um, for the center of excellence. You know, they go out, do site visits, they review the volume of patients, they review the quality of research, the facilities themselves. Um, and so it, you know, it means a lot to be considered a center of excellence. And we're certainly proud to be one here in the University of Kansas. I'm going to stop there. Let me unshare my screen. And I'm going to throw it back to Lisa. Okay, so Sorry, that, that was, was a whirlwind. That was that was a whirlwind. We did all imaging in like ten minutes, which is like master class in imaging. So all of you watching, you just got master class in imaging. Um, so we have a couple of questions. Actually, that was a comment from the last 
presentation. If you have any questions, please bring them to the screen. Um, I'm hoping that maybe you can talk about how different imaging modalities create different opportunities for measurement. And we'll typically see an echo measurement being a bit smaller than an MRI measurement and people think they got worse. Could you yeah. explain why there's a differentiation in the actual measurements? Yeah, that's a good point. And conversely, uh, or a larger measurement and think, or, or a smaller measurement and think they got better, right? So, Correct. Um, so it's a good point. Um, so, so echo is a two-dimensional imaging of a three-dimensional structure. So the heart's a three-dimensional structure um, and echo, you're, you're only seeing it in one plane, if you will. Um, so that it, it would be as if you, you know, sliced through an object. Um, um, I'm trying to think of a good analogy here. Um, you know, take an orange or an apple. If you, you, you know, if you slice right through the middle of the apple, you see the core and you see the seeds, right? And you know, you're in the middle, but you could slice at, a, at an angle at a, you know, at an oblique angle and you could get a much, you could still see some core, but you might get a much different measurement of, of the, the width of that apple. And so that's kind of the, the analogy with echo. Um, as opposed to MRI is what we call cross-sectional imaging, uh, such that you can uh, manipulate or change the position of your um, imaging to know exactly where you are in the heart um, at any point in time. And so you're going to get a more reliable, reproducible, accurate measurement by MRI. However, it's a more expensive test. Um, uh, it can be uh, claustrophobia inducing for patients. Um, and so not everyone tolerates MRI. Um, echo is um, very easy, very quick, um, and uh, is using sound waves, so it's very safe. And so um, we try to balance. You know, MRI provides um, useful information, Same additive way. information, but we we try to to balance um, and fit each modality that when it's necessary. Okay. Um, strain. Could we be using strain more in, in HCM, maybe for early indications of any type of impact on the myocardium? Are we using it enough? Do people understand it? Um, that's a good one. It's also good. So, <laughs> so um, are we using it enough? Probably not. Do we understand it? Maybe. I don't think it's to the same level of um, other aspects of echo imaging. Um, I think we probably could use it more um, in, um, especially in that patient population that, that has some contraindication or reason not to do an MRI scan. Um, I think it does, it could, uh, uh, it could very well provide some early risk stratification um, in that many times you see these kind of functional type changes um, early on, maybe even before the anatomical changes. Um, although the, the, the actual pathology should be, you should see them at the same time. Um, and that's that, that scarring or the disarray of the muscle fibers. So yeah, I, I think we could use it more. I think there's kind of a lack of expertise in strain. I won't, uh, I won't stand here and say I'm a strain expert. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I think I'm, uh, I'm able to have the conversation, but I'm not probably able to teach strain to, um, many others. So Okay, we do have a question. Um, it's an interesting one. Where does a cardiac cath versus MRI or echo come in? So when do we move from imaging to hemodynamics and testing? Yeah, good question. Um, so, so hemodynamics is gonna be important when we're starting to talk about septal reduction primarily. Um, and so um, we'll go to the cath lab um, to define anatomy of the coronary arteries to see um, do we have an appropriate branch that we could consider alcohol subdilation um, for, for instance? Um, we're going to measure invasive hemodynamics and make sure they correlate with our imaging. So um, that, that turbulence of flow that I showed you um, coming as blood is ejected out of the heart, we can measure that in the cath lab um, using a catheter to get, to get a pressure measurement. Um, and how we actually I'm asking um, you to hold for another moment, please. I've been on with two hours. How, how we how we provoke um, uh, the pressure gradient in the cath lab is by um, actually causing a PVC. Um, and so we'll just kind of uh, many times tap the muscle with the catheter and, and it will cause a PVC and that will be our um, provocable gradient in the cath lab. So it's kind of additive. it's it's uh, you're getting a little bit different information than than what you'd get um, from your um, other imaging, and it's going to be more, planning in perceptual reduction typically. 
I think that answered the question. Um, do your colleagues have any other input that they would like to give on imaging and how important? I, I will. I will. I'll set up this question a little differently. Well, I'll, um, I'd like to add on to the the human dynamics. Go right ahead. Uh, that's I would love human dynamics as being an advanced heart failure doctor. And I think in addition to, you know, risk stratifying patients who might need septal reduction therapy, I also use it a lot in patients who might be at the end stage of their hypertrophic cardiomyopathy to actually measure their failing pressures and understand their diastolic dysfunction. And one of the things I really enjoy doing is exercise hemodynamics. So having these patients exercise in the cath lab, do provocative maneuvers where you're actually measuring what's happening to their PA pressures, what's happening to their wedge. I think it's super helpful and risk stratifying some of these patients who have these restrictive phenotypes. And so um, I think it also is helpful on kind of the end of trying to figure out why are these patients feeling so poorly and having a hemodynamic correlate, I think is very helpful and maybe a reason to, you know, hey, their wedge is pretty high, um, their index is low. Maybe we got to start thinking about advanced therapies in these patients. Which could I think that's an excellent point. Segue to my uh, next talk. Yeah, we'll, we'll be jumping into that in just a second. Hang on, if that intrigued you and you wanted to know what a wedge <laughs> pressure is, hang on, we've got more. Um, so I, I'm going to get on the the bandwagon of um, of uh, HCM Center of Excellence uh, necessity. Community based echocardiography. How are they doing out there, guys? What's the quality of an echo when done in the dock at the corner versus KU? I'm gonna I'm gonna let Dr. Berenbaum answer this one because he's. <laughs> <laughs> I you know I I think it depends what they're looking for, uh, but I think when it comes to HCM, there are some particular things you need to look for and. You know, it's it's sort of it's 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 an even in our lab, it's a battle at times because it's like, you know, it's a busy lab. We got a lot of echo techs, guys. I know that it's good for throughput to have every te echo tech do the HCM echoes, but if if you really want them done right, then we need a core of echocardiographers that do this a lot, that really understand what's important, that really know how to do the things they need to do and get the information that we need. So uh, I'd say it's extremely rare that we don't repeat an outside echo because it's incomplete in some way. I will give the easy analogy here. And that is when you go to a community-based cardiologist, they're going to take some real basic images of your heart. And what you talked about cutting, cutting the orange this way versus that way at a community center, they're going to cut it this way, that way, and that way done. And they're, they're done. In an HCM center, the protocols are richer. You're going for better angles, more angles, more views typically than you would do in the community. So, you know, do you want to go get an idea of what 50 images of your heart look like, or 200 images of your heart. And in HCM, it's really important to know where the walls are different, how the papillary muscles in there, what the alignment is. So the echoes that we do in centers of excellence are far superior to that which you get in the community. So, um, you know, I know sometimes we sound very like drinking the Kool-Aid, like centers of excellence matter but they do. There's a reason why we have this model. It's We have nothing against community cardiologists. They're great people. We want to partner with them, but the imaging should be left in certain hands. Um, want to put a halter monitor on and a vent monitor on? Let your local cardiologist do that. That's okay, but imaging please leave to the centers. And on that, I hand it back to Lauren to introduce our next talk. Uh, I think I'm live. No, you, you're here. Oh, now you're on mute. <laughs> Lauren, your introduction is on mute, dear. Okay. Try that um, again. It is my pleasure to introduce Harak Shah, who is uh, one of our advanced heart failure experts and has really helped 
uh, round out that expertise at our center and, uh, and, and is really leaning in and doing a great job with our HCM patients as well. So, Barack. Thank you, Dr. Brambaum, for a great introduction. I think uh, just to make sure you guys are seeing my slides okay. Yes. Perfect. And so again, thank you for uh, organizing this session and having our group at KU kind of talk about HCM and what we're doing here at KU. And I'm gonna focus on the medical therapy and touch briefly on the advanced heart failure therapies in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So this is kind of my approach to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I um, try to be as systematic as I can. And so I usually, I'm gonna to focus today, not on all five aspects, but I'm gonna focus today on mostly the medical and surgical management of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. But before we do that, I think it's very important for me is to establish the physiology of why patients are having symptoms. And I think one of the most important aspects of that is to understand, is this hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy or do they have a non-obstructive phenotype? So I'm gonna first talk about that. And so I think one of the things I love about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and I think we alluded to, I think Lisa alluded to it, is that every patient's different. These are patients that are in my panel for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And again, Jared did a great job showing all the imaging, but I'm just gonna kind of have a big highlight point is that if you look at all of these hearts, all of these hearts have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but you can imagine all of these hearts, you don't have to be an advanced imager to know, all of those hearts look very, very different. And so you can imagine that all of these patients, their prognosis and the way you're gonna treat them are gonna be very different. And I think that's one of the fascinating things about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, because there's not really a cookie cutter approach but we can give ourselves general guidelines. And so for me, when I'm talking about management, the first question I ask myself, is this patient obstructive or non-obstructive? And you guys might know this already, but I love physiology and I'm gonna go through why this occurs and what obstruction really is. And so Jared, I think, set me up really well explaining it. Um, this is a kind of a cartoon picture of the heart. And so this is the left ventricle, this is the aorta. And you have an area here called the left ventricular outflow tract. This is the area where all blood from the ventricle is ejected into the aorta, which then goes to all our organ systems, our brain, our kidneys, our liver, our muscles. So all of our blood has to pass through this area called the LVOT. And usually this is around two centimeters, which is plenty of space for the LVOT to handle all of that blood volume coming from the left ventricle. In hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, there are a few abnormalities that work together that really impact this left ventricular outflow tract. First, in certain patients, there's left ventricular hypertrophy, obviously, but it involves this upper septum, what we call the basal septum region of the heart, right adjacent to this LVOT. Second, and I think both speakers already mentioned that there's hypercontractility of the heart. And sometimes there's mitral valve abnormalities. What ends up happening is, is that with the hypercontractile motion of the heart, there are forces that essentially push this mitral valve into the left ventricular outflow tract. So then when you actually have a heartbeat, you have this mitral valve and this hypertrophied septum essentially in prox close proximity to each other, if not actually touching each other, which significantly obstructs that flow. Basically, instead of going through a two centimeter orifice, you're going through a much smaller orifice. Basically, you're putting your thumb on a garden hose and that's gonna be the reason why patients have symptoms, why they are short of breath, why they get lightheaded or dizzy, why they can't exercise well. And so that's one of the major reasons why obstruction occurs and why um, patients are symptomatic. And so this is, again, a still shot just to make it in, in real life. Again, uh, one of my patients. And so you can see here, this area here, this is our left ventricular outflow tract. This is the hypertrophied septum, the thickened heart muscle. And then I hope you guys can, this is kind of showing, is that you can see this is the mitral valve. And you can see that when the heart beats, it kind of, goes toward this left ventricular outflow tract. So now all the blood is going through this very narrow orifice and you can imagine why patients will not feel well if that's the, if that's the case. And so I start out with that because this is actually one of the major reasons of how we can you know, treat this disease when it comes to managing these patients. And I think the important thing to understand is that this gradient is dynamic. You know, we have things like you know, a subaortic membrane or aortic stenosis, those are fixed obstructions, but this, gradient is dynamic. And so it can change based on the loading conditions of the heart. And the three things that really determine it are kind of preload, contractility, and afterload. And all of these really come down to the ideas, how can you expand this area in the left ventricular outflow tract? So let's first talk about preload. 
And I think about preload is how much fluid is in the heart. So if you're able to expand the heart by kind of filling it up with more fluid, you can imagine that you can stretch the distance between the mitral valve and the septum. And so you increase the, uh, the diameter of that left ventricular outflow tract and therefore decrease symptoms by increasing the amount of blood that's able to go through the aorta. On co conversely, if a patient is dehydrated, um, where there's too less volume or they're taking too much diuretics, you can imagine that that distance actually becomes even smaller. And so patients can get more symptomatic when they're dehydrated. Second, you can look at the contractility of the heart. As we talked about is that these hearts are hypercontractile, which is one of the reasons why this mitral valve gets pushed into this left ventricular outflow tract. And so if you increase contractility, AKA exercise, you can actually make this gradient worse. But if you do things to slow down how strong the heart beats with medicines, which we'll talk about, you can actually make that gradient better. And lastly is afterload. And when I think about afterload, I think about basically blood pressure. What is the pressure the heart is pumping against to get blood into the aorta? And so I think about it like a muscle. Basically, if the heart is pumping against a five pound muscle, that heart's able to beat very strongly. But if you make that weight 100 pounds, that heart's not going to beat as strongly. And so basically, instead of by the heart not beating as strongly, again, you prevent that mitral valve from getting pushed into that septum. And so you increase the distance. So by increasing your blood pressure, you actually decrease the amount of resistance. And by decreasing blood pressure, if someone's septic or if they have an infection, it actually makes it worse. And so the first step in management is how do you, how do you kind of mitigate or how do you use these physiologic principles to our advantage. So how do we increase preload? You want to make sure that patients avoid dehydration. How do you increase blood pressure? You, a lot of patients that I get seen are on medicines that actually already decrease blood pressure, which again, could increase the gradient. So you would want to stop medications that vasodilate the blood vessels. So that's like your amlodipines, your ACE inhibitors like lisinopril, entresto, hydralazine, clonidine. Those are medications that you would want to stop and that could actually improve the gradient by itself. And lastly, you want to work on decreasing contractility. And that's where the medical therapy comes into play. So the medical therapies are beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, disapyramide, and we'll talk about Mavicamptive. So this is an algorithm that I made, and I kind of took it uh, and kind of derived it from one of the state of the art reviews from the Journal of American Cardi uh, College of Cardiology, which had a great review piece on hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the management and diagnosis. And so first is you have um, obstructive. So if we establish that the patient has obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, at this point, we do not have a medication that changes the natural history of the disease. And so if you're asymptomatic right now, there are no therapies recommended. I hope this becomes different. My hope for this field is that we can find a medication or find some sort of intervention that can halt the progression of this disease. So we can treat patients who are asymptomatic. We can be more proactive about the disease management instead of reactive. And I do hope the myosin inhibitors could be kind of that holy grail that we've been looking for. Um, but for right now, what we do know is that if you're asymptomatic, there is no guideline directed medical therapy that's um, indicated. But if you're symptomatic with obstruction, then the first line, and again, this could change, but right now, um, most people are using the beta blockers or calcium channel blockers. The second line is a drug that I think has a lot of promise in this field, which is Mavicamptive, and we'll talk about that. One thing I did not include, which is included in other guidelines, is a medication called disopyramide. And you know that is a medication that is very powerful. It's a very powerful negative inotrope. It really does decrease contractility and really decreases resting gradients in the heart. Um, but the issue with disopyramide is that it has a lot of side effects. Um, it prolongs your QT interval. So a lot of people get admitted to the hospital when they start the medication. And then it has a lot of cholinergic side effects. And so a lot of people have issues with urinary retention, urinary frequency, not retention, sorry, urinary frequency, urgency, uh, nausea, fatigue. And so medication is not as well tolerated. Um, and so that's why I kind of think at this point, Mavicamptive, I'm glad that Mavicamptive is on the market now because it could really help some of these patients. Um, with symptomatic obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. But if you, have, if you have patients who have symptoms despite medications, then we're starting to think about septal myomectomy and alcohol septal ablation. So we'll talk about that. So first about Mavicamptive, because this is kind of the new kid on the block, and I think it's very exciting. In order to really understand why this drug works, we have to go back to the microscopic level and understand how the heart contracts. And so when you look at the heart, 
the reason why we contract is you have the contractile unit of the heart is called the sarcomere. And so the sarcomere has two major components to it, and that's the actin and the myosin. And so what actin and myosin essentially do is they form crosslinks with each other through the myosin head that helps displace the actin and decrease the sarcomere length. The way I think about it and the way I try to explain it is that the myosin have these heads, which are kind of like oars on a rowboat. And basically those oars are kind of displacing water, which is the actin, and that makes the heart go or the heart contract. That's normal. In patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, Dr. Rolden's gonna talk about the genetics, but a lot of the genetics come down to abnormalities in sarcomeric genes. A lot, the most common are in myosin. And so what you end up happening, what you end up ha have is you have too many myosin heads that are interacting with actin, which you think, oh, that's great. We have a, a, a rowboat that's, you know, you know, going really, really fast. Um, but what ends up happening is that you also need the myosin, the actin to come off of each other in order to make the next beat happen. And if they don't come off each other, then you're not relaxing the heart and the heart just becomes stiff because it's always in this kind of hypercontractile state. And so when you have an abnormality in these myosin genes and these, my, um, what ends up happening is that you have impaired relaxation in a stiff heart. And so what mavacantum, the, the mechanism is that it's a myosin inhibitor. It actually decreases the amount of cross-linking between myosin and an actin and tries to restore it back to a normal sarcomere. And by doing that, you improve left ventricular compliance, you improve left ventricular stiffness and improve in energetics, energetics of the heart. And so that, and I think the exciting thing about this medication for me is that this is the first drug um, on market that actually goes to the pathophysiology of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. A lot of the other drugs like metoprolol, diltiazem, verapamil, disopyramide, they kind of interact with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in an indirect way. But this is the first drug that, you know, really goes after the pathophysiology of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is why I think it could be really helpful. And I'm excited for the research that's coming out uh, for the medication for other indications. So quickly about data, because we have to, it makes a lot of sense physiologically, but what's the data? For me, I think the trial that really, like I thought was very impressive was the Valor study, the Valor HCM study. This was published in the Journal of American Cardio College of Cardiology in this year. And so what this study did is they enrolled 100, around 100 patients, I think it was 112 patients, and they enrolled patients that were about to undergo septal reduction surgery. So these are patients who have a lot of symptoms, who have a lot of gradient and a lot of obstruction. So these are you know, self-selected patients that, have, uh, that were essentially about to go for surgery to relieve their obstruction. And they randomized these patients in a one-to-one -one fashion to receiving mavocamptive or receiving placebo. And what they found is, is that the blue is mavocamptive. You can see at rest and at exercise or with the Valsalva, that there's a dramatic reduction in the gradient uh, uh, in the left ventricular outflow tract. And more impressively, I thought this was great, is that in the patients that got mavocamptive, 82% of those patients did not meet the indication for septal reduction therapy after the drug. That means their gradients went down so much that they did not need to have surgery based on the traditional guidelines that we set compared to 23% in the placebo. So you're, potentially you're able to avoid surgery in almost four fifths of patients who are being considered for surgery when the drug wasn't existing. In addition, you have a significant improvement in NYHA class, so patients feel better. And then I like biomarkers. And so one thing I didn't include is that if you look at NT pro BNP, which is kind of a stress hormone for the heart, those numbers go down when you're on mavocamptive. And if you look at echo images, you actually see the left atrium actually gets smaller too. So there's a lot of benefits that occur not only in symptoms, but in outcomes, but also on biomarkers and, and cardiac imaging. So a lot of positives for the drug. And I think one of the reasons why this drug is now approved for obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So quickly, just to, I mean, we're talking about management is that if patients, there are patients who still have symptoms despite having um, medical therapy. I hope that goes lower with mavocamptive, but they're still patients. And so the two options that we have to help reduce LBOT obstruction is surgical myectomy or alcohol septal ablation. And, and surgical myectomy, um, for me, just quick points about it is that it results in a pretty immediate and usually permanent relief of the LVOT gradient, which you're going in and basically go doing is going in and kind of removing that area of the septum that's causing you know the flow abnormalities in the left ventricular outflow tract. Um, I say usually permanent, most of the time, vast majority, you do one surgery 
the hyper the the obstruction doesn't come back but very rarely it might come back but majority of the time it does not also one thing that we kind of talked about is that these patients not only have hypertrophy of their left ventricle, they also might have some abnormalities in their mitral valve, whether that's mitral valve regurgitation, papillary uh, muscle abnormalities. And so by doing surgery, you allow the ability to not only just resect the septum, but correct some of the mitral valve and do a mitral valve repair. The one thing that's probably the most important about surgical myectomies is that the best outcomes and the lowest risk of mortality has to occur in patients that do high volume surgeries. And so it has to be at a high volume HCM center. Um, if you're at a high volume HCM center, your outcomes are going to be the best. And I think that's the most important point when it comes to a surgical myectomy. Alcohol septal ablation is a great other tool, but it's dependent on a lot of factors for success. First, you need the location of the hypertrophy to be, you know, in a great area, which is usually the basal septum right next to the LVOT. If you have diffuse hypertrophy, alcohol septal ablation really isn't going to help. The second, you need to make sure the coronary anatomy is correct. You need that Goldilocks of a septal perforator. You need a septal perforator that's not too big that if you um, basically put alcohol and scar it, it doesn't impact the majority of the heart and then you just have heart failure. Uh, and you don't want it to be too small where it doesn't fix the abnormality. You don't want it to be just right. So then it just kind of takes away the basal septal hypertrophy and then you don't have the obstruction. And then also, like we talked about, if you have mitral valve abnormalities, then alcohol septal ablation really is not gonna help. Um, but I do think that it is an appropriate for patients who might be of advanced age or have other comorbid conditions that would increase their risk for a surgical operation. And of note, when you look at the gradients, they're actually pretty similar after a few weeks to months after the procedures, but the alcohol septal ablation does have an increased risk of complete heart block requiring pacemaker. So about non-obstructive cardiomyopathy, unfortunately, you know, this is, this is a condition that I think is ripe for a lot of research and a lot of uh, advancement because right now we really don't have great therapies. With these patients having too much actin and myosin, these patients have a stiff heart because there's too much actin and myosin interaction. And right now the medical therapy really involves, you know, beta blockers, which I'm not sure really help in this disease process, but we give them. Uh, treatment of arrhythmias like AFib because these patients don't tolerate AFib well when they have non-obstructive cardiomyopathy. In certain patients, some patients develop systolic uh, dysfunction and what we call burnt out HCM. This is kind of my algorithm, again, for non-obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Again, if you're asymptomatic, there's not a therapy that I know of that can help reverse remodel hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. But if they're symptomatic, I kind of group it into ejection fractions. If they have a normal ejection fraction, ejection fraction greater than 50%, again, it's beta blockers, diuretics. One thing that I'm really excited about, again, is the myosin inhibitor class, the Mavicantiv. There was a trial called Maverick which showed some benefit. And right now at KU and a, a lot of other centers, there's the trial, the Odyssey trial, um, which is looking at Mavicamptive and non-obstructive HCM. And I'm hopeful that that trial is positive because right now we're, we don't have a lot of good medications for non-obstructive HCM. And then what I do is heart transplant. Some of these patients continue to have just restrictive cardiomyopathies, um, diastolic dysfunction, despite medical therapy. They can't do anything. They can't walk to the grocery store or go up a flight of stairs then those patients might be needed to consider for heart transplant. Then there's a subgroup of patients that have a left ventricular ejection fraction less than 50%. This is a very high risk phenotype in, in my opinion. Normally hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we always talk about, oh, they're hypercontractile, they have too much actin myosin. But at some point this disease could progress to a point where they actually have a low ejection fraction. And I think these patients are at high risk for complications. And these are patients that you put them on, you know, therapies that we use for heart failure. Um, but a lot of them might end up requiring heart transplantation as well. And so my last slide is about heart transplantation. You know, I do this a lot. So sometimes I, it, it's still, it's still a remarkable, crazy thing, right? You're asking someone that you're going to replace someone's heart with another heart. Um, and so it's, you know, sometimes very scary for patients. Um, it's very rare to happen in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but it does happen. And so it's important to know that this is an option for patients who have symptoms despite medical therapy. We use cardiopulmonary stress tests um, to help with that. Um, like I kind of mentioned in the previous talk, uh, I really use hemodynamics to help kind of guide with when the right time is for cardiac transplantation. But the reassuring thing I think is that cardiac transplantation for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients is very successful. And when you look at data, the survival in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy actually is better than other cardiomyopathies, ischemic or non-ischemic. And so this is data coming from the UNOS. This was published from the Utah group, um, basically looking at ischemic cardiomyopathy, 
non-ischemic cardiomyopathy and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And you can see that hypertrophic cardiomyopathy has a better survival. I think these patients are younger, don't have as many core morbid conditions. And so even though cardiac transplant is a very scary type of intervention, um, the outcomes at a good center are, are very good. And you can see at, at 60, at five years, you still have around 85% survival. And that's better than other uh, forms of cardiomyopathies that we do transplants for. So again, scary, it might happen, um, but it's something that um, has very good success. And so with that, that was kind of a whirlwind again with uh, about management of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, kind of, kind of touched on each aspect. Uh, so if someone has any more in-depth questions, please let me know and I, we can go talk about it further. Thank you. So this is a topic that is near and dear to both of my hearts. Transplant humor, it's a thing. Um, <laughs> so I wanted to talk a little bit about ejection fraction in the face of potential going into a burnt out stage. Mm -hmm. Typically in HCM, we're not paying attention to our EF. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, some people don't even really understand what an EF is. So could you, let's go back to basics for just a moment. What is an ejection fraction? What is it typically in HCM? And when do we start to look at it and go, hmm, where are we going? Yeah, yeah. So go back to the basics. Ejection fraction um, is usually on echocardiogram. And the idea is, is you have a heart um, that has a volume you know, when it's fully relaxed, the end diastolic volume, which is the volume of blood uh, right before the heart's about to beat. And then you have a volume of heart that is left over after the beat. And basically you can do kind of do a ratio of how much volume the heart was able to pump compared to how much volume the heart had at the beginning. And that's your ejection fraction. Um, and so the idea is Normal is not 100%. A lot of people are like, oh, my ejection fraction is 60%. Oh, that's like a D in math class. That's terrible. Um, normal is 55 to 60%. And in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, they're above the curve. They're at like 75, 80%. They're hyperdynamic. A lot of it has to do with that, those actin myosin. They have too much actin and myosin, and they have hypercontractivity. But in certain patients, when I see an ejection fraction that is actually normal, in a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patient, that's when I get a little worried because those patients might be at a, a, a disease stage that you know once you start dropping your ejection fraction, your normal is not 55 to 60, your normal might be 65, 70, 75. And so when you're at 50, 55, you know, if it was another heart, you might be like, okay, that's fine. But in a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy heart, I think that is a red flag to me. And that's a, that's a sign where, hey, I'm really worried about you. I need to do a little bit more testing. Those are patients I really ask detailed questions about how they're feeling. I get them on a cardiopulmonary exercise test, really understand what their exercise capacity is. I might do right heart catheterizations. They're at higher risk for sudden cardiac death. Um, those patients um, uh, are, are much higher risk when they don't become a hyper, when they're not hyperdynamic as most patients are. Thank you for that. Um, as somebody who went through this, when I found out my EF was around that 50 area, Statistically, it said seven years to transplant or death based on an article published by Barry Marin. And I went, oh, I better, I better ignore this for a while. This is scary. And I almost ignored it too long, even me. Um, so I encourage you to just know what your EF is. If it drops, have a conversation. It doesn't mean something is going to happen right then and there. You may still feel well for a while, and then things might get interesting. I did it. I can do it, you can do it. It's it's doable. Okay, so that was the, that's the scary minority of the population. Rare. Rare, 5% of us will, will go there, um, which is actually a good number. It used to be 1% of the UNOS registry was HCM. Now we're about 5%, which means we're getting identified and we're getting prioritized and we're getting to where we need to be. But you gotta kind of know that you're heading there so you can get there in time. So we'll leave that rare, common, obstructive HCM. So I am here in California this week doing what I call the biotech tour. Um, today I was over at Legacy Myocardia BMS, Bristol Myers Squibb. Um, I was actually with the team that developed Mavicampton today. 
Um, and we were talking about remember when all the way back in 2014, when we thought of a concept and um, it was really a great day. Um, there's new trials being formed and there's more questions being asked um, about additional therapies. Maybe now that we've got the myosin inhibitors here and we know they work in obstructive, we're trying them in a bigger trial in non-obstructive. So that's coming up and we're, I think um, the first patient was screened today or yesterday or tomorrow, it's happening this week. Um, so we're gonna do more non-obstructed, but we're already talking about, okay. So if we can get people from feeling this bad to this good, how do we get them to the finish line if MAVA doesn't do it? So we had some interesting conversations about what next. So we're not done yet. Mm -hmm. We still have more to do. Um, the Afikampton trial is coming up. You can uh, enroll in that if, if, if you're an interested patient. And this is for a slightly different myosin inhibitor. Slightly different property, shorter half-life, works a little bit teensy weensy, like a, a spec different, but it's how much is in your system and how quickly you can get rid of it. Um, so it's that's coming. Other companies are coming. Um, I have a question here that I'm gonna throw a question to our faculty. Like, what would you guys like to see a track, you know, address next in the unmet need category? Is there a patient population or a magic wand drug that you would hope somebody would create? Because the universe is listening lately and we might as well throw it out there and get some great ideas. While you think of that, let me ask the question that's on the table. Mm -hmm. Outside of medicine or surgical interventions, what can patients do um, to keep their EF over 50? Would exercise be dangerous? Oh my God, that's such a great complicated, we can dive into that one for an hour question. That was an awesome question, Kendra. Um, okay, which part of this do we wanna take? I think, I mean- All, all hands on deck for this one. I think, you know, I can kind of give you um, my thoughts on, you know, well, the ejection fraction staying above 50%, it's hard to do it yourself. Um, there's not, I would say there's not anything that people can do to really make it better or make it worse. I think the thing that I try to highlight in my talk is that, you know, if you have obstructive HCM, it is dynamic. There are things you can do from a lifestyle standpoint to really make sure that obstruction doesn't get worse. But in terms of ejection fraction, I think that's really hard to really you know, manipulate based on what we do um, on a day-to-day -day basis. I think the exercise question is obviously, I think we could have our own just exercise, you know, talk. Um, uh, and I didn't include exercise because I think there's a lot of nuances that go into it. Um, I can give you my like quick 10 second spiel about it. And then I'm sure others can, you know, exercise is great. We do know that there are so many cardiovascular benefits of exercise um, and all the, and we, but the thing about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, I think we all, maybe most of us, either know someone or have heard someone who was, you know, playing. I mean, in high school, I when I was in, in high school, one of our varsity uh, basketball players dropped dead in the uh, in, in, when playing a game at home, and he had hypertrophic cardiomyopathy at, at the end of it. One of my good friends in cardiology fellowship, same situation, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So it's common. I think that gets the exercise a little bit scary. What can you do? Um, I would say the literature on that is actually changing a lot, which I think is really good for the field because I think we're learning a lot more about, you know, what is the risk? But I would say, in my opinion, is that, you know, moderate level exercising is, I recommend it. You know, if you're doing high level, like sprinting or competitive activities where you're doing like, you know, pro professional athlete type of level athletes, I, I don't feel comfortable recommending that yet, but I would say, you know, moderate level, um, you know, great. If you have obstructive, you really want to avoid doing a lot of things that, you know, cause a lot of Valsalva maneuvers where you're bearing down a lot. So don't squat 400 pounds like Dr. Kavapal might do. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, uh, but you can still do moderate exercise and it's actually better for you and more beneficial for your, for your overall cardiovascular health. Okay. Um, faculty, can I get a thumbs up for all who agree that exercise and HCM is good, healthy, and should be done in consultation with your team? Thumbs up. We have every thumb up here. So now I would, I would go just, I would, I echo Dr. Shaw there. And I, I think sometimes patients want to know 
numbers. And so what I, I agree with the moderate exercise, not heavy, not kind of isometric, uh, heavy lifting. So what I'll tell them is, you know, we can kind of predict our, our maximal heart rate based on our age. And that's a simple math equation, 220 minus your age. And so if you take, uh, let's just use 50. Um, uh, so, cause it's a nice round number. So a 50 year old patient, um, the max heart rate is going to be around 170. And so I tell patients, I don't want you to exceed about 70% of that predicted of your maximal predicted heart rate. And I think that's a nice kind of moderate, um, you know, cause anymore we have, you know, wearable technologies, Apple watch, you name the, you know, Garmin watch, et cetera. And so you can kind of, you know, um, you can track your heart rate and if it starts getting up to that upper level of where we want you to be, it's time to back it off a little bit, you know? And so, um, that's been my approach and it's been, it's been fairly effective. So. This is an evolving area. Um, in 1996, when I started this work, you had HCM go sit down, don't move. Knitting might be a little too, you know, racy for you. So just rock in the chair. Um, that was kind of the tone that we got. And then we evolved to, well, we should probably walk. We should probably do some little bit of exercise. Oh no, we can have an exercise routine. We can maybe do recreational sports, maybe even some competitive sports based on the anatomy of the heart and the anatomy of the game we're playing. So we're evolving and understanding what's safe in the Live HCM registry, which thank you to the 2200 volunteers. Um, and we're still at 1600 and following them. Um, the data is going to be out soon from that registry. And we're seeing that it's safer than we thought to do certain levels of exercise. And we have varsity level athletic individuals in this registry, college athletes, um, HCM patients are everywhere. So they're all out there and we're all kind of um, gonna have that data soon. So exercise is really, really important. Getting back to Kendra's question, um, and, and I know we're gonna be talking about genetics coming up, but there are genetic markers and genetic reasons why the ejection fraction eventually kind of drops. The muscle is challenged. It's not a normal muscle. It's working differently, it's harder. And at some point for reasons still a little confusing, it either stiffens up or just gives out. And it fails in those two ways. So we didn't really talk a lot about really low ejection fraction heart failure in HCM. It's, it's very rare that you kind of burn out and drop your ejection fraction into the twenties, but it does happen. And there are genetic drivers and you, you didn't do anything wrong. I'm one of these people, I don't do anything wrong. I was like the queen of HCM compliance, right? And my heart still got just too stiff and thick, even though I exercised and I ate well. All right, maybe I ate a little too much sometimes, but you know, girl's gotta have her vice. Um, and I think overall, we could probably take the blame away from the patient on that one and, and just try to stay healthy in every other way. Um, any other thoughts on that? Okay, now what about your dream drugs? While we're talking about medical management, who has dream drugs or dream therapies? Stiff heart. Yeah, the non-obstructives. We've, we've, we've got, and, and obviously we don't manage every obstructive patient as ideally as we'd like to. There are still problem patients, but you know, if you take a hundred new referral problem obstructive patients and a hundred new referral problem non-obstructive patients, you know, put do the things we need to do, whether that takes six months or a couple of years to work through what the where we go. At the end of that time, most of those obstructive patients, I think, can be doing really well. But the non-obstructive patients, too much of the time, we're observing their natural history. Now, we may be improving on it around the edges, but, but we can't do as much. And, you know, what, uh, what I tell patients is your heart spends more time trying to relax than it does trying to contract. And we've mostly focused on contraction in the history of cardiology. 
we're just barely beginning to understand the relaxation phase, but we need things to help the heart relax so it can fill normally, because if it can't fill, doesn't matter how good the pump is, if you can't prime it, it's not gonna work, so. You just remind, reminded me of a statement made to me, I'm thinking like 1996, 1997, um, Dr. Grant Parr, who is a cardiac surgeon in Morristown, New Jersey, he and I were having a conversation about like what the real problem is with HCM. And he said, it's all about diastolic dysfunction and whoever can figure out diastolic dysfunction deserves a Nobel prize. And I think that's really what it is. So diastolic meaning that the heart's relaxation, it just can't relax, why not? And I think he might be right because some of the people that are working on some of the genetics behind this might actually end up with a Nobel Prize someday. So I, I, I agree that we need to do more there. Um, and hopefully the myosin inhibitors will, and if not, the next thing coming behind it. Okay, so we've wrapped up those questions and I went off on my tangent. Thank you for uh, indulging. Um, I'm sure there's gonna be some other Cam's IOS questions as we go into open questions at the end. Just a reminder, as we get this next talk going, at the end of, uh, the next two talks, we'll have a little open discussion and then we will stop streaming on Facebook and then we will um, go ahead and cut off the recording feature. So if any of the uh, individuals participating in the Zoom room wanna ask a question that isn't on the Facebook live stream or on the YouTube later, um, you will be having an opportunity to ask that um, off camera, so to speak. Um, and if you have not taken the poll, please do so, I forgot to, break and do that earlier, but we will um, review that at the end of the session. So if you just let us know where you're from, we'd appreciate that. Okay, um, Lauren, you wanna introduce our next speaker. So Dr. Roldan is new on the block. She has just joined us in the last few weeks from uh, the University of Utah, Salt Lake City. Uh, and uh, she is dynamic and charming and I am really thrilled to have her in the program and look forward to working with her. So uh, Paolo, take it away. Thank you, Dr. Berenbaum. You're charming as well. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Thumbs up, Baron. All right, perfect. Okay. So I have uh, the pleasure of talking about genetics of HCM and the role of genetic screening in family members. Um, similar to Dr. Shaw, I'm one of the advanced heart failure and transplant cardiologists. Um, I do want to preface the talk by saying that I'm not a geneticist, but I will do my best to answer any questions at the end of the talk. So without further ado. All right. So as you all know, the human body is made up of cells. Within each cell, there are genes that make up the DNA, which form something called chromosomes. Humans have a total of 46 chromosomes. 23 come from the egg and 23 come from the sperm. From each parent, you receive 22 numbered chromosomes. And these are the chromosomes that come into play when discussing HCM and then one sex chromosome. Genetic mutations can occur when there is a change in gene that leads to a different DNA code, which leads to the production of abnormal cells and or proteins. There are five different ways individuals can inherit genetic disorders, but HCM is predominantly inherited in an autosomal dominant pattern and rarely in an autosomal recessive pattern. And the term autosomal refers to genetic change, change that occurs in one of the 22 numbered chromosomes that you inherit from either the sperm or the egg or both. So in regards to autosomal dominant, a patient with HCM, for instance, this person right here, inherits the altered gene from an affected parent. And as shown here, the affected mother here passes on the gene to two of her four children, those in the dark blue. And then in regards to autosomal recessive, a patient with HCM inherits the altered gene from both parents. These parents who carry one copy of the altered gene <coughs> carriers and typically do not show any signs or symptoms of the genetic condition. 
So as shown here, the father and the mother both carry the altered gene and both parents pass on the altered gene to one of their children, the one in dark blue. And then these two children right here in the light blue um, inherit one copy of the altered gene and are now considered carriers. There's rare cases where the condition may result from a new change in a gene in a patient with HCM. And as a result, this patient will have no family history of the disorder. And then the prevalence of HCM um, is not uncommon. It's estimated to be about one in 500 individuals. And there's now case studies um, stating that it's probably even more common, such as one in 300 individuals and it affects males and females equally. Um, and as we've been talking about, it's a, largely a disease that's caused by gene mutations that encode abnormal sarcomeric proteins, um, which are the important heart proteins, which ultimately cause the heart muscle to be too thick and too stiff, as Dr. Kavapal already beautifully explained, and so did Dr. Shah. And then interestingly, only 60 to 65% of patients with HCM have an identifiable disease causing or likely disease causing gene variant. A possible reason for this is that some genetic causes of HCM are still unknown at this time. And perhaps there are other non-genetic factors that we have yet to fully establish. Um, but the most common genetic changes, which account for about 80% of all cases where a genetic cause is found, occur in the MYH7 um, or the MYBPC3 genes, which Dr. Shaw alluded to are the myosin binding proteins. Um, and then there's a few other that are common as well um, that are listed here. In regards to um, why some patients who inherit a disease causing mutation for HCM do not develop any signs or symptoms or develop the disease at varying ages in life or develop different degrees of severity. There's really two main factors. And these two main factors are called penetrance and expressivity. So incomplete penetrance refers to a person with a gene mutation, for instance, an MYH7 gene mutation who does not develop the signs or symptoms of a genetic disorder, for instance, HCM. Variable expressivity, on the other hand, refers to the range of signs and symptoms that can occur in different people with the same genetic condition. So for instance, one family member with HCM may have mild or light onset symptoms, while another family member with HCM develops severe, rapidly progressive, or early onset symptoms. And then incomplete penetrance and variable expressivity, they're likely caused by a combination of genetic, comma, environmental, and lifestyle factors, but most of which have not been fully identified. So then moving on to family screening. So counseling patients with HCM regarding the potential um, for genetic transmission of the disease is one of the biggest cornerstones of care that we provide our patients and their families. And um, there's two main ways we screen first degree relatives. Um, and I should say asymptomatic first degree relatives. And this is either by genetic testing with genetic counseling um, or by following an imaging protocol, which includes a combination of an EKG, a heart ultrasound um, and or cardiac MRI. And the reason to pursue one way over the other is really dependent on the relative's preference and whether or not the patient with HCM was found to have a disease causing or likely disease causing gene variant on genetic testing. The other question that comes up is when to start screening. So the answer is it really depends on the patient and the family history, as well as the family preference. But according to the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart of Association, screening should really start around 12 years of age or earlier in the following scenarios. So the first degree relative has presence of any cardiac symptoms. There's a family history of sudden cardiac death. Um, the relative wants to participate in competitive sports. 
um, or there's early onset of disease, so prior to 12 years of age in a first degree relative. If genetic screening is pursued, there are two main companies that our cardiology team uses for the testing of uh, gene causes for HCM, and that's Ambry Genetics and Invitae. Um, both companies offer testing of 30 to 44 genes that are known to cause or likely cause HCM. Their turnaround time for both is about 14 to 21 days. Uh, preferred testing samples, blood, but some alternatives uh, for some of them include saliva as well as a mouth swab. And then, as I alluded to earlier, they offer both pre and post genetic counseling, which I think is crucial um, uh, through both companies. So then in regards to what genetic testing results mean, so this is a, an extremely brief overview, um, which the test results that one receives should be discussed in more depth with a genetic counselor, a geneticist, or the referring physician, but a pathogenic mutation or a variant likely pathogenic result means a positive test. And this confirms the uh, diagnosis of HCM. And as a result, um, testing or genetic testing is recommended for asymptomatic first degree relatives. And then there's a variant of unknown significance or VUS for short. And it means just that. It's unclear whether or not this genetic mutation definitively results in HCM. And as a result, our team typically recommends surveillance of family members with an imaging protocol. And the genetic testing of these family members is typically more educational and for research purposes, um, which could eventually show that whether or not the variant of unknown significance in two to three years or in three to five years is actually truly negative or if it's truly positive. Um, so the genetic screening in this population doesn't go without void. It's just that we would do additional imaging protocol for these individuals as well. Um, and then finally, the, the no variants detected or the likely benign variant is a negative result. Um, and it just means that the diagnosis of HCM is not a result of a genetic cause, and therefore genetic testing is not suggested for screening of other first degree family members who are asymptomatic. And then finally, the imaging protocol. So um, if genetic screening isn't possible or if family members pursue a non-genetic testing imaging protocol, um, serial EKG and echocardiography or cardiac MRI is recommended at periodic intervals, depending on the relative's age. So for children with family members with a positive genetic mutation or with early onset HCM, an EKG and a heart ultrasound should be performed every one to two years at the age of 12 years or earlier in those specific scenarios we previously discussed. And then for all other children and adolescents, an EKG and a heart ultrasound should be performed every two to three years, starting around the age of 12 years. And then for adults defined as 25 years or older, an EKG and a heart ultrasound should be performed every three to five years. And again, just to emphasize, this is an asymptomatic first degree relatives, and this is for screening purposes. So that concludes my conversation about genetics as well as genetic screening. And then um, I wanted to leave this slide here um, to contact us or to arrange for an appointment at our center. Um, this is the number to call. Um, Dr. Berenbaum, Dr. Shaw, Dr. Kavapo, as well as myself, will be happy to, to meet you and serve you. And then we've got a wonderful nurse team that includes Barb Lee, uh, Kristen, Kyle, Angela, Aaron, and Don. Fantastic. Thank you very much. We'll do a couple of questions. Um, if anybody has any questions, use the Q&A box, please. I did want to make one maybe nuanced mm, correction, but clarification to one aspect of your definition of mutation slide. Yeah. Negative. I, I prefer the no mutation identified to a negative. I wish the labs would get on board with me on that. But it doesn't mean it's not from a genetic source. It means it's not from an identi 
identifiable genetic source at this time. Yeah. So that if you get a negative report back, that doesn't mean you can't go back later as new identified genes come up and reevaluate. So just, it, yes, it's a negative, nothing was found, but it could be genetic. We just haven't found it yet. Or yeah. the, ne the next level here is the concept of polygenetics, meaning multiple mutations in a cluster might actually be why you have BHCM. Your yes. thoughts? Uh, yeah, and to kind of allude to that, Ambry Genetics as well as Invitae do send out addended reports when they find out either VUS result or, I haven't seen this, but a likely benign variant result is actually truly pathogenic or likely pathogenic, depending on you know the research that comes out or case studies that come out. Um, so yes, to your point, it does mean at this time, it's a non-identifiable cause for genetic mutation at this time. And, and just sort of a further clarification, you know, when you've got a family and there's like eight people with HCM in that family, it's genetic. It's not eight separate random mm -hmm. cases. And just because we haven't identified a gene doesn't mean it's not genetic. Uh, it just means that we can't use genetic testing to help clarify how to manage a patient. So if a patient comes to me and says, my mom has HCM, I was worried about it, so I got genetic testing and I'm negative, so I'm off the hook, right? And the answer is, I have no idea. I need to know if mom is positive or negative. If mom has an abnormal genetic test and you're negative, then our current understanding is, yes, absolutely, you're off the hook. But if mom tests negative, well, of course you're negative unless you're like that one in a million random mutation. Uh, and, and so you always want to do your genetic testing on somebody that you know has the disease. And, and the other thing I stress to people is, I know you have HCM. We're going to do genetic testing. If it comes back negative, that doesn't mean I've misdiagnosed you. It means we don't have your gene. It means we have to manage your extended family differently. We need to do the EKGs and the echoes and, and a more expensive, more complicated follow-up. The reason to get a genetic test is if it's positive, then you can really remove a lot of uncertainty in the family. And additionally, in today's world, and I held this till now, um, so I did an amazing thing on Tuesday. I went to a manufacturing facility that was just absolutely breathtaking in terms of the technology that I was able to witness. And this new manufacturing facility will be manufacturing genetic corrections for myosin binding protein C mutations. Wow. I, I, I want to just give everybody a little bit of an understanding about the facilities and the undertaking. So first, there was the base science that took years to develop. How do you deliver a genetic therapy only to the heart? So that science is, is being evolved and we think we're there, we think we can do this. So there is this process of manufacturing. They actually had sterile rooms produced in Texas. I'm in California. They were produced in Texas. They were put on, I think, 14 or 17 flatbeds, trailered across the United States. They had to cut a hole in the building to bring these modules in. And as they say, play the most expensive game of Tetris you've ever seen to put them all inside the facility, re-sterilize them, reseal them, where they will be actually taking cells, putting proteins in those cells that are missing from the myosin binding protein C patients and delivering them through an IV solution. And I was in the plant. The plant is enormous. 
and they have enough space to replicate everything they built plus about 20%. This is not a small endeavor. This building that I walked in has got to be at least $50 million to build and to put all of these resources in place. This is a major move and a sustainability model that makes this product reproducible here in the United States. Um, if you're not allowed to make it out of the United States and inject it into somebody in the States from my understanding of regulatory language. But this is like, this is one of the other reasons why you wanna have genetic testing. If you're in known mutation, there may be some pretty big things coming your way. And I'm not saying that genetic therapies are going to wipe out all HCM because we don't know that yet. And it's definitely not for everybody just because you have a mutation and a, and a little HCM and, and, and that's it. Maybe someday it's gonna be for those people, but these we're gonna have to do clinical trials. We need a couple of really brave and and caring and compassionate patients to step to the plate and do something really big, really big. There's a couple steps we have to go through before we're ready to do that type of thing, but it is coming. And I am so cautiously optimistic that this might be the end of HCM and generational families of, of trauma and grief and disease and burden. Like we might be able to do this. So why do you wanna get genetic testing? If not to screen the rest of your family, at least to know when the potentials come about, whether or not you can consider being part of that or it's an option for you at all. So um, if you haven't done it yet, talk to your doctor. So what do you guys think about that? That's, That's like this pretty person. amazing. Yeah, it's exciting time. Okay, Lauren, introduce our next speaker. Barb. Barb's on so, mute. Hi. Barb is our, our point person for the HCM clinic and, and in particular is an expert on Mavicampta or or and and how to obtain Mavicamptin and all of the intricacies of that process. So uh Barb, if you can just speak for a couple of minutes about uh the things you do and how you interact with patients and how you help and uh where you keep your magic wand that gets them Mavicamptin. <laughs> Sure. Thank you, Dr. Birnbaum. It's really a pleasure working at KU with um, these experts. And just from, because I'm a nurse, um, what I get to see is patients come in and really just have a discussion with their physician. I mean, when you think of the different topics tonight, talked about HCM and all the expertise, um, when it comes down to helping a patient make a decision about a therapy like Mavicampton or um, what kind of tests they need next or what medications they need or, or things that they're experiencing, um, it really does become the patient's choice. So it's, it's really an honor to be a part of that and to see patients get treated so well. Um, with the Mavic Hampton, um, I've been able to see patients. We have patients drive several hours. We have patients miss a whole day of work to come back for their clinic visits. Um, we have patients asking about their echoes and what does that mean for them and really sorting through is what they're experiencing a side effect or um, just their HCM and asking about their offspring, their family, and how that affects. So um, it's really exciting to be a part of all that and to know that if Dr. Berenbaum has a question, he has several expert colleagues to talk to and likewise. Um, and I think that's a, a big advantage of going to a large center like KU. 
Absolutely. Okay. Um, if somebody wanted to make an appointment with the KU program, do you guys have contact information or are we just using the directory listing at the HCMA? Um, I think Dr. Roland had a slide up of yeah. that phone okay. number. Um, there you go. And at this time, really, the that's the best place for a patient to call that initial phone number. Um, the the people that help make the appointments can always get in touch with the nurses if there is a specific question or if a patient wants to see a certain type of physician, then they or certain type of cardiologist, then the schedulers um, kind of give that information to the nurses to help us discuss with the cardiologist, which, which one might be the best for them. Fantastic. So everybody, you can get the phone number here. If you're watching this um, live, I just want to remind you that the HCMA maintains a directory listing of our recognized centers of excellence. So you can also get this information on the HCMA website and that, um, that's a good resource for you to utilize. Okay, Barbara, thank you so much. Um, we can go back to, and thank you for the screen share there, Bella. Um, so now we're gonna go answer some questions. I'll do one or two questions and I'll, uh, I'll kind of tell you who's here on the poll uh, first, and then we'll do the questions. So we have, oh, that's the bottom. I was, I was I've already kind of looked ahead. Um, we have participants from the Southeast, the Midwest, and the Western United States regions. Um, I know we got a couple of Northeasterners. They work for us, but I don't think that counts. Um, we have patients, 27% uh, patient and family member, 20%, a family member, 7%. We have medical providers as well as industry representatives today. Welcome industry reps. Want to teach you. We want you to be part of the team. And we're happy to have you here and other medical professionals. It's always nice to learn from each other. So of those who have HCM who are here today, 20% uh, were diagnosed in the just in the last two years. And we know that's a really interesting time for an HCM family. Lots to learn and get used to. 53% um, are on meds, 47% have devices, 27% have had an alcohol septal ablation or a myectomy. Uh, 40% or 47% are AFib. 33% um, of us have lost a family member to HCM. And mm, interesting, uh, only, what was that, 5%? Five, 5%? Five oh, wait, I'm up here, sorry. Um, my goodness. I am so not used to working off a laptop, people. I'm so sorry. Um, I saw a genetic, oh, there's genetic testing. 33% have had genetic testing, so there's a big opportunity there for some of you to get that done. Um, some of them have been considering an ICD, one person, but hasn't gotten it. Ask questions, person on fence on ICD, we're happy to walk you through that and help you. Um, a couple of people are considering septal reduction therapy, and 13% uh, are considering a new medication or device at this time. So that's a little bit about who was here tonight. And as we go into the final questions, um, keep that population in mind. Oops, that's not my question box. Okay, um, so going back to talk number one, we have a question. If I was experiencing a life-threatening arrhythmia and measures were delivered to my implantable defibrillator, is there any notification that is automatically initiated um, if so, are there circumstances when notification would not occur? Lauren, I guess that one's to you. So if you have a defibrillator and you are set up with remote monitoring and your remote monitor is working, then we should get notification of that. And that would be, you know, a high level notification where information goes from your device to the company, they would call the physician on call at two o'clock in the morning, and we would touch base with you. Um, now, you know, I have patients who, and this is across all disease entities, uh, in general, people, when they get a first shock, are a little bit freaked out about it, which is perfectly understandable. And they're 
uniformly going to come to the emergency room. Uh, you know, that's not always the case. Back in the days before we had remote monitoring, a few times a year, somebody would come in the office and we'd interrogate the device and you'd say, well, you had a shock six months ago. I was like, yeah, you know, but I've had shocks before and, and, and I meant to call you and it just, it got away from me and then I never did. And I'm kind of going, really? Uh, Cause I think I would call if, if, but you know, we want to hear from you. Uh, I wouldn't rely on that chain to absolutely happen and a call comes to you. If you get a shock, or sometimes people think they get a shock, what we call a phantom shock, but there isn't a shock, uh, you know, call, we'll talk to you, decide if you need to come to the emergency room, do you come to the ER in the morning, you know, but, but we're probably going to want to look at you pretty quickly, get some basic lab work and just make sure that there isn't something going on that we need to tweak. Uh, and, you know, you may end up in the hospital for a day or two. Chances are good you won't. So additionally, um, the device monitoring issue, um, technology changes over time. And each time you get a new device, the technology is never the same as it was. The monitoring has become much more sophisticated over time. Okay, Lauren, I'm going to date ourselves here. Remember when pacemaker clinic, you had the handheld thing on the phone and you put the phone down and the magnet over it. So we've evolved a little from handheld phones going over monitors giving we want, we want sounds that made sense to a computer somewhere. Um, and now it, it does alert if there's something that happens. Um, I just talked to somebody the other day and they're like, yeah, my device went off again last night. Number nine, this is a person who gets a lot of shocks and they roll on with it and call their doctor. This is what happened. Okay, how you feel? Moving on now, no hospitalization. So um, as somebody who lived with an implantable device for over 25 years, um, they become your friend. They become your safety net in a sense. So to the person who's on the fence, I hope you're still out there. Um, really talk to other patients. We have discussion groups. Talk to your physicians. Talk to your nurses. It's it's a really normal life with an ICD after about six months, you kind of get used to the idea of it being there. So please don't let that stop you. Um, genetic question, uh, are there programs or grants patients can use to offset the cost? Number one, this is really great news. Most insurance companies will pay for genetic testing. And some of the companies have out-of-pocket maxes. You know, you're talking for like a hundred bucks, you can get a test of your genome. Um, there are a couple of free programs that were available. So if your insurance doesn't pay, they will pay, but they'll put it through your insurance first. Um, so that was the MVT program. Ambry has a industry sponsored, uh, project, which I have, I'm waiting to get some more information on, but my understanding is it can be free, but again, they'll put it through your insurance first. If insurance kicks back, then it'll get paid for. Um, somebody um, in, a lab, in another session asked me about um, genetic discrimination potential. So if you have already been diagnosed with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you are covered under the Americans with Disabilities Act in terms of discrimination based on your cardiac status. If you are not diagnosed and you're only doing genetics, in 2008, a law passed called GINA, the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, and that withholds um, that information uh, from your employer to be used against you in any way, shape, or form, from your um, educational opportunities, and from access to health insurance. Life insurance and long-term disability, it's very, very different. Um, they're still going to hit you with, you know, big fees. Um, but you you cannot be discriminated against because of your genetic status. And testing is very, very, very affordable. Um, so you can call us and we can give you some more information on that or check our website. Hope that answered that question. Another question coming in on myosin inhibitors. Um, the data on myosin inhibitors looks similar to existing sodium channel inhibitors. What are the barriers for non-pharmacy to conduct trials comparing um, the okay, all right. So you're you're putting disapyramide 
um, and suboxazine in okay, sodium. Okay, um, I'm trying to understand the question. It's been a long day. Um, can we do can we do a head to head? I do believe that there is an arm of uh, one of the AFI Campton trials, so the cytokinetics trial that um, will use disapyramide in com combination. And I think there's a comparator line on that one. If anybody's on that committee, um, I think you can. Get, I think they are comparing um, Daiso to AFI. But I'm going to be meeting with them tomorrow afternoon. I can clarify, and you can call and ask me the question again. I think that's what they're doing. Um, and you are, or can, or possibly using two drug types in conjunction. So um, if any of you are on one of the um, a PI for your site, I believe you're allowed to be on a beta blocker um, or a calcium channel blocker, not both with the Mavic Hampton trial. There's so many trials right now. Correct. My brain is like, yeah. So you can only be on one, you couldn't be on two. Um, so there, it's I already been done. I don't think there's any data on disopyramide and Mavicampton. So I don't think that that is something that, that I think the label says don't mix them simply because there's no data. So the label says don't mix them, but there is a clinical trial underway mixing them. But, and it appears to be safe. I just saw the data at the American Heart Association conference in November. Okay. So that that's that's out there. I'm sure there's an abstract we can probably pull if somebody wanted a little bit more data. It's a very small population though. Yeah. Um, but head to head, I, is it, does anybody know if Sequoia is doing a head to head? I don't know. I know Bristol Myers is going to start a trial of beta blocker versus Mavicampton as first line therapy. Uh, and then they're starting, we're in a trial where we'll, we'll be in the diastolic non-obstructive HCM. We're in a trial for that, which we sh hopefully will start enrolling by Christmas. Uh, but IRBs and contracting are always slow. Um, but that is a randomized trial. So you're gonna be 50-50 whether you get placebo or an active drug. You're not giving- Is there a crossover at the end on that one? I don't believe there is. I, I wouldn't, I haven't looked that far ahead because I haven't enrolled the first patient. Uh, we've but been I encouraging that they all include a crossover so that if patients weren't and they and they went through the effort to do the trial, then they could get on and then they could then they could get on a long-term extension potentially. So that I think that's in there, but you're gonna want to double check on, on the protocol language. Um, it's very specific. Um, I do want to give another um, it's coming. We're already having conversations about this and the FDA is okay to it. Um, there's gonna be a pediatric trial. Good. We haven't done any pediatric trials in HCM. With a, with a novel agent like in 30, 40 years. So um, that's probably not until this time next year. So it's gonna be a little while. So uh, I believe the ages are gonna be 12 to 17 will be recruited and it's about a year off. So it, it, it's coming, it's it's coming. We wanna, we, wanna do, we wanna do better for the kids, right? So we'll get there. Um, it certainly is an exciting time for development in HCM. Um, I'm going to I'm going to be quiet for a minute and I'm going to ask you guys to tell everybody why it's important to listen to a clinical trial coordinator and hear about clinical trials and then make decisions whether they want to be in or not. Why are trials so important? Lauren, you want to start? First. I nominate Lauren to be our speaker. <laughs> so, you know, we we. The way we try and practice medicine is based on data, not, you know, it's Tuesday and it's the afternoon and it's an odd numbered month. So let's try, you know, salt and pepper for this patient and just sort of randomly pick things. 
we try and practice medicine based on data that says, you know, this treatment in this type of patient generally gives good results. Uh, and, and we only, we don't get data, you know, out of thin air. It requires patients being in studies, collecting that information so that going forward, you can provide people better advice and better therapies. Uh, you know, one of the trials will be in not quite as sexy as something new, uh, but we're going to be in a long-term registry for uh, Mavicampton because these trials are a relatively modest number of patients. The, I mean, I think one of the slides shown on Mavicampton was 16 weeks of data. Well, if you're 30 years old and I'm going to put you on a medicine, you might, you know, and you say, well, doc, what's the 20 year follow up on Mavicampton? I'm going to say it's a new drug. I don't have it. But the FDA has realized that you can't just take short term data and pretend that's exactly what happens for 50 years. We need long term data. Uh, so, you know, it's really pretty much standard of care. There's not a lot of extras involved, but it allows us to collect your data and find out over the course of five years what's going on with this drug, how are people doing long-term. So I think it's a really important study, even though it might not be quite as sexy as you know, a new indication for a drug or a new drug. Certainly not as sexy as giving you uh, new cells that cure you of HCM. Yeah, so clinical trials aren't always flashy. The Live HCM study, you know, you got an old fashioned wearable Fitbit and we asked you to, to do some surveys for us about exercise. So we knew how you did over time. Um, so we're gonna change ideas about what exercise is. We gotta do the same with, with drugs. And part of the reason that the FDA approved Mavic Campton with such limited data was because you, the patients, participated in a patient-focused drug development meeting, and you told the FDA, we want to be able to try, and we'll help build science. Your words, I gave you the platform, you came to the meeting, you shared your thoughts, and the FDA heard you. And it's kind of like amazing, really. The FDA really did listen to the patient and said, okay, the REMS program, I know it's a pain in the neck, and I'm sorry to all the clinical people that are going nuts, scheduling all those echoes, but we asked for it and it, and we got it. So we really can't complain, but we will because logistically it is hard. So thank you for to all of the prescribers out there that are going through all of the stuff that Barbara's figured out how to master in short order, bravo to Barbara. Um, but we need to we need to do more trials. We need more data and we need great volunteers to do it. And sometimes it's just signing a paper and letting them look at your data. And sometimes you actually have to do some tests and get some blood draws. If we're gonna ask the kids to do it, grownups can do it. Other thoughts? We're gonna say goodbye to Facebook. Bye Facebook. I, I would, Lisa, I would just like to, I would like to thank all my partners. 